aging fellow young Enots on your individual deep space journeys in the hidden realms of the collective unconscious. You will enjoy this video over and over again and leave bookmarks in the comments for this highly illustrated book by Carl Jung, complete with audio highlighted text and incredible imagery. Lots of uses like to motivate the creator archetype in my unconscious to convince me to make more videos like this. And welcome to Hidden Highway. My channel is mostly about fan life so far, but I'm interested in integrating concepts from Carl Jung's teachings into videos that are related to traveling, maps, fan life, and more. Even my random videos about walks my dog will show a touch of Jung after some hidden highways between Jung's archetypes of the collective unconscious and van life enter my consciousness. 713, the Sanskrit word mandala means circle in the ordinary sense of the word. In the sphere of religious practices and in psychology, it denotes circular images, which are drawn, painted, modeled, or danced. Plastic structures of this kind are to be found, for instance, in Tibetan Buddhism, and as dance figures these circular patterns occur also in dervish monasteries. As psychological phenomena, they appear spontaneously in dreams, in certain states of conflict, and in cases of schizophrenia. Very frequently, they contain a quaternity, or a multiple of four, in the form of a cross, a star, a square, an octagon, etc. In alchemy, we encounter this motif in the form of quadralura circuli. 714 In Tibetan Buddhism, the figure has the significance of a ritual instrument, yantra, whose purpose is to assist meditation and concentration. Its meaning in alchemy is somewhat similar inasmuch as it represents the synthesis of the four elements which are forever tending to fall apart. Its spontaneous occurrence in modern individuals enables psychological research to make a closer investigation into its functional meaning. As a rule a mandala occurs in conditions of psychic dissociation or disorientation, for instance in the case of children between the ages of 8 and 11 whose parents are about to be divorced, or in adults who, as the result of a neurosis and its treatment, are confronted with the problem of opposites in human nature and are consequently disoriented, or again in schizophrenics whose view of the world has become confused, owing to the invasion of incomprehensible contents from the unconscious. In such cases, it is easy to see how the severe pattern imposed by circular image of this kind compensates the disorder and confusion of the psychic state, namely, through the construction of a central point to which everything is related, or by a concentric arrangement of the disordered multiplicity and of contradictory and irreconcilable elements. This is evidently an attempt at self-healing on the part of nature, which does not spring from conscious reflection but from an instinctive impulse. Here, as comparative research has shown, a fundamental schema is made use of, an archetype which, so to speak, occurs everywhere and by no means owes its individual existence to tradition, any more than the instincts would need to be transmitted in that way. Instincts are given in the case of every newborn individual and belong to the inalienable stock of those qualities which characterize a species. What psychology designates as archetype is really a particular, frequently occurring, formal aspect of instinct, and is just as much an a priori factor as the latter. Therefore, despite external differences, we find a fundamental conformity in mandalas regardless of their origin in time and space. 715 The squaring of the circle is one of the many archetypal motifs which form the basic patterns of our dreams and fantasies. But it is distinguished by the fact that it is one of the most important of them from the functional point of view. Indeed, it could even be called the archetype of wholeness. Because of this significance, the quaternity of the one is the schema for all images of God, as depicted in the visions of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Enoch, and as the representation of Horus with his four sons also shows. The latter suggests an interesting differentiation, inasmuch as there are occasionally representations in which three of the sons have animals' heads and only one a human head, in keeping with the Old Testament visions as well as with the emblems of the seraphim which were transferred to the evangelists, and, last but not least, with the nature of the Gospels themselves, three of which are synoptic and one Gnostic. Here I must add that, ever since the opening of Plato's Timaeus, one, two, three but where, my dear Socrates, is the fourth, and right up to the Cabri scene in Faust, the motif of four as three and one was the ever-recurring preoccupation of alchemy. 
716. The profound significance of the quaternity, with its singular process of differentiation extending over the centuries, and now manifest in the latest development of the Christian symbol. 4. Just as this symbol claims a central position in the historical documents, individually too, it has an outstanding significance. As is to be expected, individual mandalas display an enormous variety. The overwhelming majority are characterized by the circle and the quaternity. In a few, however, the three or the five predominates, for which there are usually special reasons. 717 Whereas ritual mandalas always display a definite style and a limited number of typical motifs as their content, individual mandalas make use of a well-nigh unlimited wealth of motifs and symbolic allusions, from which it can easily be seen that they are endeavoring to express either the totality of the individual in his inner or outer experience of the world, or its essential point of reference. Their object is the self in contradistinction to the ego, which is only the point of reference for consciousness, whereas the self comprises the totality of the psyche altogether, i.e., conscious and unconscious. It is therefore not unusual for individual mandalas to display a division into a light and a dark half, together with their typical symbols. An historical example of this kind is Jacob Bohm's mandala, in his treatise XL Questions Concerning the Soul. It is at the same time an image of God and is designated as such. This is not a matter of chance, for Indian philosophy, which developed the idea of the self, Atman or Purusha, to the highest degree, makes no distinction in principle between the human essence and the divine. Correspondingly, in the Western mandala, the scintilla, or soul spark, the innermost divine essence of man, is characterized by symbols which can just as well express a God image namely the image of deity unfolding in the world, in nature, and in man. 718 The fact that images of this kind have under certain circumstances a considerable therapeutic effect on their authors is empirically proved and also readily understandable, in that they often represent very bold attempts to see and put together apparently irreconcilable opposites and bridge over apparently hopeless splits. Even the mere attempt in this direction usually has a healing effect, but only when it is done spontaneously. Nothing can be expected from an artificial repetition or a deliberate imitation of such images. A study in the process of individuation. Introductory. 525, during the 1920s, I made the acquaintance in America of a lady with an academic education, we will call her Miss X who had studied psychology for nine years. She had read all the more recent literature in this field. In 1928, at the age of 55, she came to Europe in order to continue her studies under my guidance. As the daughter of an exceptional father, she had varied interests, was extremely cultured, and possessed a lively turn of mind. She was unmarried, but lived with the unconscious equivalent of a human partner, namely, the animus, the personification of everything masculine in a woman in that characteristic liaison so often met with in women with an academic education. As frequently happens, this development of hers was based on a positive father complex. She was fia papa and consequently did not have a good relation to her mother. Her animus was not of the kind to give her cranky ideas. She was protected from this by her natural intelligence and by a remarkable readiness to tolerate the opinions of other people. This good quality, by no means to be expected in the presence of an animus, had, in conjunction with some difficult experiences that could not be avoided, enabled her to realize that she had reached a limit and got stuck, and this made it urgently necessary for her to look round for ways that might lead her out of the impasse. That was one of the reasons for her trip to Europe. Associated with this there was another, not accidental, motive. On her mother's side, she was of Scandinavian descent, since her relation to her mother left very much to be desired, as she herself clearly realized, the feeling had gradually grown up in her that this side of her nature might have developed differently if only the relation to her mother had given it a chance. In deciding to go to Europe, she was conscious that she was turning back to her own origins and was setting out to reactivate a portion of her childhood that was bound up with the mother. Before coming to Zurich, she had gone back to Denmark, her mother's country. There the thing that affected her most was the landscape and unexpectedly there came over her the desire to paint, above all, landscape motifs. Till then, she had noticed no such aesthetic inclinations in herself, also she lacked the ability to paint or draw. 
She tried her hand at watercolors, and her modest landscapes filled her with a strange feeling of contentment. Painting them, she told me, seemed to fill her with new life. Arriving in Zurich, she continued her painting efforts, and on the day before she came to me, for the first time she began another landscape, this time from memory. While she was working on it, a fantasy image suddenly thrust itself between her and the picture. She saw herself with the lower half of her body in the earth, stuck fast in a block of rock. The region roundabout was a beach strewn with boulders. In the background was the sea. She felt caught and helpless. Then she suddenly saw me in the guise of a medieval sorcerer. She shouted for help, I came along and touched the rock with a magic wand. The stone instantly burst open, and she stepped out uninjured. She then painted this fantasy image instead of the landscape and brought it to me on the following day. Picture 1. 526, as usually happens with beginners and people with no skill of hand, the drawing of the picture cost her considerable difficulties. In such cases it is very easy for the unconscious to slip its subliminal images into the painting. Thus it came about that the big boulders would not appear on the paper in their real form, but took on unexpected shapes. They looked, some of them, like hard-boiled eggs, cut in two, with the yolk in the middle. Others were like pointed pyramids. It was in one of these that Miss X was stuck. Her hair, blown out behind her, and the movement of the sea suggested a strong wind. 527 the picture shows first of all her imprisoned state, but not yet the act of liberation. So it was there that she was attached to the earth, in the land of her mother. Psychologically, this state means being caught in the unconscious. Her inadequate relation to her mother had left behind something dark and in need of development. Since she succumbed to the magic of her motherland and tried to express this by painting, it is obvious that she is still stuck with half her body in Mother Earth, that is, she is still partly identical with the mother and, what is more, through that part of the body which contains just that secret of the mother which she had never inquired into. 528. Since Miss X had discovered all by herself the method of active imagination I have long been accustomed to use, I was able to approach the problem at just the point indicated by the picture, she is caught in the unconscious and expects magical help from me, as from a sorcerer. And since her psychological knowledge had made her completely au fait with certain possible interpretations, there was no need of even an understanding wink to bring to light the apparent suantandu of the liberating magician's wand. The sexual symbolism, which for many naive minds is of such capital importance, was no discovery for her. She was far enough advanced to know that explanations of this kind, however true they might be in other respects, had no significance in her case. She did not want to know how liberation might be possible in a general way, but how and in what way it could come about for her. And about this I knew as little as she. I know that such solutions can only come about in an individual way that cannot be foreseen. One cannot think up ways and means artificially, let alone know them in advance, for such knowledge is merely collective, based on average experience, and can therefore be completely inadequate, indeed absolutely wrong in individual cases. And when, on top of that, we consider the patient's age, we would do well to abandon from the start any attempt to apply ready-made solutions and warmed-up generalities of which the patient knows just as much as the doctor. Long experience has taught me not to know anything in advance and not to know better, but to let the unconscious take precedence. Our instincts have ridden so infinitely many times, unharmed, over the problems that arise at this stage of life that we may be sure the transformation processes which make the transition possible have long been prepared in the unconscious and are only waiting to be released. 529, I had already seen from her previous history how the unconscious made use of the patient's inability to draw in order to insinuate its own suggestions. I had not overlooked the fact that the boulders had surreptitiously transformed themselves into eggs. The egg is a germ of life, with a lofty symbolical significance. It is not just a cosmogonic symbol, it is also a philosophical one. As the former it is the Orphic egg, the world's beginning, as the latter, 
the philosophical egg of the medieval natural philosophers, the vessel from which, at the end of the Opus Alchemicum, the homunculus emerges, that is, the anthropos, the spiritual, inner, and complete man, who in Chinese alchemy is called the Chinyan, literally, perfect man. 2. 530. From this hint, therefore, I could already see what solution the unconscious had in mind, namely individuation, for this is the transformation process that loosens the attachment to the unconscious. It is a definitive solution, for which all other ways serve as auxiliaries and temporary makeshifts. This knowledge, which for the time being I kept to myself, bade me act with caution. I therefore advised Miss X not to let it go at a mere fantasy image of the act of liberation, but to try to make a picture of it. How this would turn out I could not guess, and that was a good thing, because otherwise I might have put Miss X on the wrong track from sheer helpfulness. She found this task terribly difficult owing to her artistic inhibitions. So I counseled her to content herself with what was possible and to use her fantasy for the purpose of circumventing technical difficulties. The object of this advice was to introduce as much fantasy as possible into the picture, for in that way the unconscious has the best chance of revealing its contents. I also advised her not to be afraid of bright colors, for I knew from experience that vivid colors seem to attract the unconscious. Thereupon a new picture arose. Picture 2. 531. Again there are boulders, the round and pointed forms, but the round ones are no longer eggs, they are complete circles, and the pointed ones are tipped with golden light. One of the round forms has been blasted out of its place by a golden flash of lightning. The magician and magic wand are no longer there. The personal relationship to me seems to have ceased, the picture shows an impersonal natural process. 532. While Miss X was painting this picture she made all sorts of discoveries. Above all, she had no notion of what picture she was going to paint. She tried to reimagine the initial situation, the rocky shore and the sea are proof of this. But the eggs turned into abstract spheres or circles, and the magician's touch became a flash of lightning cutting through her unconscious state. With this transformation she had rediscovered the historical synonym of the philosophical egg, namely the rotundum, the round, original form of the anthropos, or sigma tau omicron iota chi epsilon omicron nu sigma tau omicron gamma gamma upsilon lambda omicron nu, round element, as Zosimos calls it. This is an idea that has been associated with the anthropos since ancient times. The soul, too, according to tradition, has a round form. As the monk of Heisterbach says, it is not only like to the sphere of the moon, but is furnished on all sides with eyes, ex omni part oculata. We shall come back to this motif of polyophthalmia later on. His remark refers in all probability to certain parapsychological phenomena, the globes of light or globular luminosities which, with remarkable consistency, are regarded as souls in the remotest parts of the world. 533 the liberating flash of lightning is a symbol also used by Paracelsus and the alchemists for the same thing. Moses' rock-splitting staff, which struck forth the living water and afterwards changed into a serpent, may have been an unconscious echo in the background. Lightning signifies a sudden, unexpected, and overpowering change of psychic condition. 534. In this spirit of the fire flash consists the great almighty life, says Jacob Bohm. For when you strike upon the sharp part of the stone, the bitter sting of nature sharpens itself, and is stirred in the highest degree. For nature is dissipated or broken asunder in the sharpness, so that the liberty shines forth as a flash. The flash is the birth of the light. It has transformative power, for if I could in my flesh comprehend the flash, which I very well see and know how it is, I could clarify or transfigure my body therewith, so that it would shine with a bright light and glory and then it would no more resemble and be conformed to the bestial body, but to the angels of God. Elsewhere Bohm says, as when the flash of life rises up in the center of the divine power, wherein all the spirits of God attain their life, and highly rejoice. Of the source spirit Mercurius, he says that it arises in the fire flash. Mercurius is the animal spirit which, from Lucifer's body, struck into the salmeter of God like a fiery serpent from its hole, 
as if there went a fiery thunderbolt into God's nature, or a fierce serpent, which tyrannizes, raves, and rages, as if it would tear and rend nature all to pieces. Of the innermost birth of the soul, the bestial body attains only a glimpse, just as if it lightened. The triumphing divine birth lasteth in us men only so long as the flash lasteth, therefore our knowledge is but in part, whereas in God the flash stands unchangeably, always eternally thus. 535. In this connection I would like to mention that Bohm associates lightning with something else too. That is the quaternity, which plays a great role in the following pictures. When caught and assuaged in the four qualities or four spirits, the flash, or the light, subsists in the midst or center as a heart. Now when that light, which stands in the midst or center, shines into the four spirits, then the power of the four spirits rises up in the light, and they become living, and love the light, that is, they take it into them, and are impregnated with it. The flash, or stock, or pith, or the heart, which is generated in the powers, remains standing in the midst or center, and that is the sun. And this is the true Holy Ghost, whom we Christians honor and adore, for the third person in the deity. Elsewhere Bohm says, when the fire flash reaches the dark substance, it is a great terror, from which the cold fire draws back in a fright as if it would perish, and becomes impotent, and sinks into itself. But now the flash, makes in its rising a cross with the comprehension of all properties, for here arises the spirit in the essence, and it stands thus. If thou hast here understanding, thou needest ask no more, it is eternity and time, God and love and anger, also heaven and hell. The lower part, which is thus marked, is the first principle, and is the eternal nature in the anger, viz. The kingdom of darkness dwelling in itself, and the upper part, with this figure, is the salmeter, the upper cross above the circle is the kingdom of glory, which in the flagrat of joy in the will of the free libet proceeds from the fire in the luster of the light into the power of the liberty, and this spiritual water, is the corporality of the free libet, wherein the luster from the fire and light makes a tincture, viz. a budding and growing and a manifestation of colors from the fire and light. Figure 1. Mandala from Jacob Bohm's XL Questions, Concerning the Soul, 1620, the picture is taken from the English edition of 1647. The quaternity consists of Father, H. Ghost, Son, and Earth or Earthly Man. It is characteristic that the two semicircles are turned back to back instead of closing. 536, I have purposely dwelt at some length on Bohm's disquisition on the lightning because it throws a good deal of light on the psychology of our pictures. However, it anticipates some things that will only become clear when we examine the pictures themselves. I must therefore ask the reader to bear Bohm's views in mind in the following commentary. I have put the most important points in italics. It is clear from the quotations what the lightning meant to Bohm and what sort of a role it plays in the present case. The last quotation in particular deserves special attention, as it anticipates various key motifs in the subsequent pictures done by my patient, namely the cross, the quaternity, the divided mandala, the lower half of which is virtually equivalent to hell and the upper half to the lighter realm of the salmeter. For Bohm, the lower half signifies the everlasting darkness that extends into the fire, while the upper, salmitrous half corresponds to the third principle, the visible, elemental world, which is an emanation of the first and other principle. The cross, in turn, corresponds to the second principle, the kingdom of glory, which is revealed through magic fire, the lightning, which he calls a revelation of divine motion. The luster of the fire comes from the unity of God and reveals his will. The mandala therefore represents the kingdom of nature, which in itself is the great everlasting darkness. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, or the glory, i.e., the cross, is the light of which John 1 verse 5 speaks, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. The life that breaks itself off from the eternal light and enters into the object, as into the selfhood of properties, is only fantastic and foolish, even such as the devils were, and the souls of the damned are, as can be seen, from the fourth number. For the fire of nature is called by Bohm the fourth form, and he understands it as a spiritual life fire, that exists from a continual conjunction, of hardness, i.e., 
the solidified, dry salmeter, and motion, the divine will. Quite in keeping with John 1 verse 5 the quaternity of the lightning, the cross, pertains to the kingdom of glory, whereas nature, the visible world and the dark abyss remain untouched by the fourfold light and abide in darkness. 537. For the sake of completeness I should mention that is the sign for cinnabar, the most important quicksilver or HGS. The coincidence of the two symbols can hardly be accidental in view of the significance which Bohm attributes to Mercurius. Ruland finds it rather hard to define exactly what was meant by cinnabar. The only certain thing is that there was a cap iota nunu beta alpha o iota, tau nu iota lambda omicron sigma omega nu, cinnabar of the philosophers, in Greek alchemy, and that it stood for the rubedo stage of the transforming substance. Thus, Zosimo says, after the preceding process, you will find the gold-colored fiery red, like blood. That is the cinnabar of the philosophers, and the copper man, chi alpha lambda kappa nu theta rho omega pi omicron, turned to gold. Cinnabar was also supposed to be identical with the Uroboros dragon. Even in Pliny, Cinnabar is called Sanguis Draconis, dragon's blood, a term that lasted all through the Middle Ages. On account of its redness it was often identified with the philosophical sulfur. A special difficulty is the fact that the wine-red cinnabar crystals were classed with the new alpha cap epsilon, carbons, to which belong all reddish and red-tinted stones like rubies, garnets, amethysts, etc. They all shine like glowing coals. The lambda iota theta nu theta rho alpha cap epsilon, anthracites, on the other hand, were regarded as quenched coals. These associations explain the similarity of the alchemical signs for gold, antimony, and garnet. Gold, after mercury the most important philosophical substance, shares its sign with what is known as regulus or button antimony, and during the two decades prior to the writing of Signatura Return, 1622, from which our quotation comes, this had enjoyed particular fame as the new transformative substance and panacea. Basilius Valentinus' Triumphal Car of Antimony was published about the first decade of the 17th century, the first edition possibly in 1611, and soon found the widest acclaim. The sign for garnet is, and means salt. A cross with a little circle in it means copper, from the Cyprian, Venus. Medicinal tartaric acid is denoted by, and hydrogen potassium tartrate, tartar, has the signs. Tartar settles on the bottom of the vessel, which in the language of the alchemists means, in the underworld, Tartarus. 538. I will not attempt here any interpretation of bone symbols, but will only point out that in our picture the lightning, striking into the darkness and hardness, has blasted a rotundum out of the dark Masa Confusa and kindled a light in it. There can be no doubt that the dark stone means the blackness, i.e., the unconscious, just as the sea and sky and the upper half of the woman's figure indicate the sphere of consciousness. We may safely assume that Bohm's symbol refers to a similar situation. The lightning has released the spherical form from the rock and so caused a kind of liberation. But, just as the magician has been replaced by the lightning, so the patient has been replaced by the sphere. The unconscious has thus presented her with ideas which show that she had gone on thinking without the aid of consciousness and that this radically altered the initial situation. It was again her inability to draw that led to this result. Before finding this solution, she had made two attempts to portray the act of liberation with human figures, but with no success. She had overlooked the fact that the initial situation, her imprisonment in the rock, was already irrational and symbolic and therefore could not be solved in a rational way. It had to be done by an equally irrational process. That was why I advised her, should she fail in her attempt to draw human figures, to use some kind of hieroglyph. It then suddenly struck her that the sphere was a suitable symbol for the individual human being. That it was a chance idea, I'd fall is proved by the fact that it was not her conscious mind that thought up this typification, but the unconscious, for an Einfall falls in quite of its own accord. It should be noted that she represents only herself as a sphere, not me. I am represented only by the lightning, purely functionally, so that for her I am simply the precipitating cause. As a magician I appeared to her in the apt role of Hermes Kalinios, of whom the Odyssey says, 
Meanwhile Selene and Hermes was gathering in the souls of the suitors, armed with the splendid golden wand that he can use at will to cast a spell on our eyes or wake us from the soundest sleep. Hermes is the Sinu Kainu Alpha Tau Iota Omicron, originator of souls. He is also the Gamma Tau Omega Rho Omicron Nu Epsilon Rho Omega Nu, guide of dreams. For the following pictures it is of special importance that Hermes has the number 4 attributed to him. Martianus Capella says, the number 4 is assigned to the Selenian, for he alone is held to be a fourfold god. 539, the form the picture had taken was not unreservedly welcome to the patient's conscious mind. Luckily, however, while painting it Miss X had discovered that two factors were involved. These, in her own words, were reason and the eyes. Reason always wanted to make the picture as it thought it ought to be, but the eyes held fast to their vision and finally forced the picture to come out as it actually did and not in accordance with rationalistic expectations. Her reason, she said, had really intended a daylight scene, with the sunshine melting the sphere free, but the eyes favored a nocturne with shattering, dangerous lightning. This realization helped her to acknowledge the actual result of her artistic efforts and to admit that it was in fact an objective and impersonal process and not a personal relationship. 540. For anyone with a personalistic view of psychic events, such as a Freudian, it will not be easy to see in this anything more than an elaborate repression. But if there was any repression here we certainly cannot make the conscious mind responsible for it because the conscious mind would undoubtedly have preferred a personal imbroglio as being far more interesting. The repression must have been maneuvered by the unconscious from the start. One should consider what this means. Instinct, the most original force of the unconscious, is suppressed or turned back on itself by an arrangement stemming from the same unconscious. It would be idle indeed to talk of repression here since we know that the unconscious goes straight for its goal and that this does not consist solely in pairing two animals, but in allowing an individual to become whole. For this purpose wholeness, represented by the sphere, is emphasized as the essence of personality, while I am reduced to the fraction of a second, the duration of a lightning flash. 541. The patient's association to lightning was that it might stand for intuition, a conjecture that is not far off the mark, since intuitions often come like a flash. Moreover, there are good grounds for thinking that Miss X was a sensation type. She herself thought she was one. The inferior function would then be intuition. As such, it would have the significance of a releasing or redeeming function. We know from experience that the inferior function always compensates, complements, and balances the superior function. 48. My psychic peculiarity would make me a suitable projection carrier in this respect. The inferior function is the one of which least conscious use is made. This is the reason for its undifferentiated quality, but also for its freshness and vitality. It is not at the disposal of the conscious mind, and even after long use it never loses its autonomy and spontaneity, or only to a very limited degree. Its role is therefore mostly that of a deus ex machina. It depends not on the ego, but on the self. Hence it hits consciousness unexpectedly, like lightning, and occasionally with devastating consequences. It thrusts the ego aside and makes room for a superordinate factor, the totality of a person, which consists of conscious and unconscious and consequently extends far beyond the ego. This self was always present but sleeping, like Nietzsche's image in the stone. It is, in fact, the secret of the stone, of the lapis philosophorum, in so far as this is the prima materia. In the stone sleeps the spirit Mercurius, the circle of the moon, the round and square, the homunculus, Tom Thumb and Anthropos at once, whom the alchemists also symbolized as their famed lapis philosophorum. 542 all these ideas and inferences were naturally unknown to my patient, and they were known to me at the time only in so far as I was able to recognize the circle as a mardala, the psychological expression of the totality of the self. Under these circumstances, there could be no question of my having unintentionally infected her with alchemical ideas. The pictures are, in all essentials, genuine creations of the unconscious, their inessential aspects, landscape motifs, are derived from conscious contents. 
543. Although the sphere with its glowing red center and the golden flash of lightning play the chief part, it should not be overlooked that there are several other eggs or spheres as well. If the sphere signifies the self of the patient, we must apply this interpretation to the other spheres, too. They must therefore represent other people who, in all probability, were her intimates. In both the pictures, two other spheres are clearly indicated. So I must mention that Miss X had two women friends who shared her intellectual interests and were joined to her in a lifelong friendship. All three of them, as if bound together by fate, are rooted in the same earth, i.e., in the collective unconscious, which is one and the same for all. It is probably for this reason that the second picture has the decidedly nocturnal character intended by the unconscious and asserted against the wishes of the conscious mind. It should also be mentioned that the pointed pyramids of the first picture reappear in the second, where their points are actually gilded by the lightning and strongly emphasized. I would interpret them as unconscious contents pushing up into the light of consciousness, as seems to be the case with many contents of the collective unconscious. In contrast to the first picture, the second is painted in more vivid colors, red and gold. Gold expresses sunlight, value, divinity even. It is therefore a favorite synonym for the lapis, being the orum philosophicum or orum potable or orum vitrium. 544. As already pointed out, I was not at that time in a position to reveal anything of these ideas to Miss X for the simple reason that I myself knew nothing of them. I feel compelled to mention this circumstance yet again, because the third picture, which now follows, brings a motif that points unmistakably to alchemy and actually gave me the definitive incentive to make a thorough study of the works of the old adepts. Picture 3 545, the third picture, done as spontaneously as the first two, is distinguished most of all by its light colors. Free-floating in space, among clouds, is a dark blue sphere with a wine-red border. Round the middle runs a wavy silver band, which keeps the sphere balanced by equal and opposite forces, as the patient explained. To the right, above the sphere, floats a snake with golden rings, its head pointing at the sphere, an obvious development of the golden lightning in picture two but she drew the snake in afterwards on account of certain reflections. The whole is a planet in the making. In the middle of the silver band is the number. The band was thought of as being in rapid vibratory motion, hence the wave motif. It is like a vibrating belt that keeps the sphere afloat. Miss X compared it to the ring of Saturn. But unlike this, which is composed of disintegrated satellites, her ring was the origin of future moons such as Jupiter possesses. The black lines in the silver band she called lines of force, they were meant to indicate that it was in motion. As if asking a question, I made the remark, then it is the vibrations of the band that keep the sphere floating? Naturally, she said, they are the wings of Mercury, the messenger of the gods. The silver is quicksilver. She went on at once, Mercury, that is Hermes, is the noose, the mind or reason, and that is the animus, who is here outside instead of inside. He is like a veil, that hides the true personality. We shall leave this latter remark alone for the moment and turn first to the wider context, which, unlike that of the two previous pictures, is especially rich. 546. While Miss X was painting this picture, she felt that two earlier dreams were mingling with her vision. They were the two big dreams of her life. She knew of the attribute big from my stories of the dream life of African primitives I had visited. It has become a kind of colloquial term for characterizing archetypal dreams, which as we know have a peculiar numinosity. It was used in this sense by the dreamer. Several years previously, she had undergone a major operation. Under narcosis, she had the following dream vision, she saw a gray globe of the world. A silver band rotated about the equator and, according to the frequency of its vibrations, formed alternate zones of condensation and evaporation. In the zones of condensation appeared the numbers 1 to 3, but they had the tendency to increase up to 12. These numbers signified nodal points or great personalities who played a part in man's historical development. 
The number 12 meant the most important nodal point or great man, still to come, because it denotes the climax or turning point of the process of development. These are her own words. 547, the other dream that intervened had occurred a year before the first one, she saw a golden snake in the sky. It demanded the sacrifice, from among a great crowd of people, of a young man, who obeyed this demand with an expression of sorrow. The dream was repeated a little later, but this time, the snake picked on the dreamer herself. The assembled people regarded her compassionately, but she took her fate proudly on herself. 548, she was, as she told me, born immediately after midnight, so soon afterwards, indeed, that there was some doubt as to whether she came into the world on the 28th or on the 29th. Her father used to tease her by saying that she was obviously born before her time, since she came into the world just at the beginning of a new day, but only just, so that one could almost believe she was born at the twelfth hour. The number twelve, as she said, meant for her the culminating point of her life, which she had only now reached. That is, she felt the liberation as the climax of her life. It is indeed an hour of birth, not of the dreamer, but of the self. This distinction must be borne in mind. Five hundred and forty nine. The context to picture three here established needs a little commentary. First, it must be emphasized that the patient felt the moment of painting this picture as the climax of her life and also described it as such. Second, two big dreams have amalgamated in the picture, which heightens its significance still more. The sphere blasted from the rock in picture two has now, in the brighter atmosphere, floated up to heaven. The nocturnal darkness of the earth has vanished. The increase of light indicates conscious realization, the liberation has become a fact that is integrated into consciousness. The patient has understood that the floating sphere symbolizes the true personality. At present, however, it is not quite clear how she understands the relation of the ego to the true personality. The term chosen by her coincides in a remarkable way with the Chinese Chinyin, the true or complete man, who has the closest affinity with the Homo Quadratus 58 of alchemy. 59. As we pointed out in the analysis of picture 2, the rotundum of alchemy is identical with Mercurius, the round and square 60 in picture 3. The connection is shown concretely through the mediating idea of the wings of Mercury, who, it is evident, has entered the picture in his own right and not because of any non-existent knowledge of Bohm's writings. 550. For the alchemists, the process of individuation represented by the opus was an analogy of the creation of the world, and the opus itself an analogy of God's work of creation. Man was seen as a microcosm, a complete equivalent of the world in miniature. In our picture, we see what it is in man that corresponds to the cosmos, and what kind of evolutionary process is compared with the creation of the world and the heavenly bodies, it is the birth of the self, the latter appearing as a microcosm. It is not the empirical man that forms the correspondentia to the world, as the medievalists thought, but rather the indescribable totality of the psychic or spiritual man, who cannot be described, because he is compounded of consciousness as well as of the indeterminable extent of the unconscious. The term microcosm proves the existence of a common intuition, also present in my patient, that the total man is as big as the world, like an anthropos. The cosmic analogy had already appeared in the much earlier dream under narcosis, which likewise contained the problem of personality, the notes of the vibrations were great personalities of historical importance. As early as 1916, I had observed a similar individuation process, illustrated by pictures, in another woman patient. In her case too, there was a world creation, depicted as follows, see figure 2. 551, to the left, from an unknown source, three drops fall, dissolving into four lines, or two pairs of lines. These lines move and form four separate paths, which then unite periodically in a nodal point and thus build a system of vibrations. The nodes are great personalities and founders of religions, as my erstwhile patient told me. It is obviously the same conception as in our case, and we can call it archetypal in so far as there exist universal ideas of world periods, critical transitions, gods and half-gods who personify the eons. 
The unconscious naturally does not produce its images from conscious reflections, but from the worldwide propensity of the human system to form such conceptions as the world periods of the Parsas, the Yugas and avatars of Hinduism, and the Platonic months of astrology with their bull and ram deities and the great fish of the Christian Aeon. Figure 2 Sketch of a picture from the year 1916 at the top, the sun, surrounded by a rainbow-colored halo, divided into twelve parts, like the zodiac. To the left, the descending, to the right, the ascending, transformation process. 552, that the nodes in our patient's picture signify or contain numbers is a bit of unconscious number mysticism that is not always easy to unravel. So far as I can see, there are two stages in this arithmetical phenomenology, the first, earlier stage, goes up to three, the second, later stage up to twelve. Two numbers, three and twelve, are expressly mentioned. Twelve is four times three. I think we have here stumbled again on the axiom of Maria, that peculiar dilemma of three and four, which I have discussed many times before, because it plays such a great role in alchemy. I would hazard that we have to do here with a tetrameria, as in Greek alchemy, a transformation process divided into four stages of three parts each, analogous to the twelve transformations of the zodiac and its division into four. As not infrequently happens, the number would then have a not merely individual significance, as the patient's birth number, for instance, but a time-conditioned one too, since the present aeon of the fishes is drawing to its end and is at the same time the twelfth house of the zodiac. One is reminded of similar Gnostic ideas, such as those in the Gnosis of Justin, the father, Elohim, begets with Edom, who was half woman and half snake, twelve fatherly angels, and Edom gives birth besides these to twelve motherly angels, who, in psychological parlance, represent the shadows of the twelve fatherly ones. The motherly angels divide themselves into four categories, Muroeda, of three each, corresponding to the four rivers of paradise. These angels dance round in a circle, Epsilonu Cairo Kapanu Kapalam Iota Kappa. It is legitimate to bring these seemingly remote associations into hypothetical relationship, because they all spring from a common root, i.e., the collective unconscious. 553. In our picture Mercurius forms a world-encircling band, usually represented by a snake. Mercurius is a serpent or dragon in alchemy, Serpens Mercurialis. Oddly enough, this serpent is some distance away from the sphere and is aiming down at it, as if to strike. The sphere, we are told, is kept afloat by equal and opposite forces, represented by the quicksilver, or somehow connected with it. According to the old view, Mercurius is duplex, i.e., he is himself an antithesis. Mercurius or Hermes is a magician and god of magicians. As Hermes Trismegistus, he is the patriarch of alchemy. His magician's wand, the caduceus, is entwined by two snakes. The same attribute distinguishes Asclepios, the god of physicians. The archetype of these ideas was projected onto me by the patient before ever the analysis had begun. 554. The primordial image underlying the sphere girdled with quicksilver is probably that of the world egg encoiled by a snake. But in our case, the snake symbol of Mercurius is replaced by a sort of pseudophysicistic notion of a field of vibrating molecules of quicksilver. This looks like an intellectual disguising of the true situation, that the self, or its symbol, is entwined by the mercurial serpent. As the patient remarked more or less correctly, the true personality is veiled by it. This, presumably, would then be something like an Eve in the coils of the paradisal serpent. In order to avoid giving this appearance, Mercurius has obligingly split into his two forms, according to the old established pattern, the Mercurius crudus or vulgi, crude or ordinary quicksilver, and the Mercurius philosophorum, the spiritus mercurialis or the spirit Mercurius, Hermes nous, who hovers in the sky as the golden lightning snake or nous serpent, at present inactive. In the vibrations of the quicksilver band we may discern a certain tremulous excitement, just as the suspension expresses tense expectation, hover and haver, suspended in pain. For the alchemists quicksilver meant the concrete, material manifestation of the spirit Mercurius, as the above-mentioned mandala in the scolia to the Tractatus Aureus shows, the central point is Mercurius, 
and the square is Mercurius divided into the four elements. He is the anima mundi, the innermost point and at the same time, the encompasser of the world, like the Atman in the Upanishads. And just as Quicksilver is a materialization of Mercurius, so the gold is a materialization of the sun and the earth. 555. A circumstance that never ceases to astonish one is this, that at all times and in all places alchemy brought its conception of the lapis or its minera, raw material, together with the idea of the homo altus or maximus, that is, with the anthropos. Equally, one must stand amazed at the fact that here too the conception of the dark round stone blasted out of the rock should represent such an abstract idea as the psychic totality of man. The earth and in particular, the heavy cold stone is the epitome of materiality, and so is the metallic quicksilver which, the patient thought, meant the animus, mind, nous. We would expect pneumatic symbols for the idea of the self and the animus, images of air, breath, wind. The ancient formula lambda theta omicron o lambda theta omicron, the stone that is no stone, expresses this dilemma, we are dealing with a complexio oppositorum, with something like the nature of light, which under some conditions behaves like particles and under others like waves, and is obviously in its essence both at once. Something of this kind must be conjectured with regard to these paradoxical and hardly explicable statements of the unconscious. They are not inventions of any conscious mind, but are spontaneous manifestations of a psyche not controlled by consciousness and obviously possessing all the freedom it wants to express views that take no account of our conscious intentions. The duplicity of Mercurius, his simultaneously metallic and pneumatic nature, is a parallel to the symbolization of an extremely spiritual idea like the anthropos by a corporeal, indeed metallic, substance, gold. One can only conclude that the unconscious tends to regard spirit and matter not merely as equivalent but as actually identical, and this in flagrant contrast to the intellectual one-sidedness of consciousness, which would sometimes like to spiritualize matter and at other times to materialize spirit. That the lapis, or in our case the floating sphere, has a double meaning is clear from the circumstance that it is characterized by two symbolical colors, red means blood and effectivity, the physiological reaction that joins spirit to body, and blue means the spiritual process, mind or noose. This duality reminds one of the alchemical duality corpus and spiritus, joined together by a third, the anima, as the ligamentum corporis et spiritus. For Bohm, a high deep blue mixed with green signifies liberty, that is, the inner kingdom of glory of the reborn soul. Red leads to the region of fire and the abyss of darkness, which forms the periphery of Bohm's mandala, see figure 1. Picture 4 556, picture 4, which now follows, shows a significant change. The sphere has divided into an outer membrane and an inner nucleus. The outer membrane is flesh-colored and the originally rather nebulous red nucleus in picture 2 now has a differentiated internal structure of a decidedly ternary character. The lines of force that originally belonged to the band of quicksilver now run through the whole nuclear body, indicating that the excitation is no longer external only but has seized the innermost core. An enormous inner activity now began, the patient told me. The nucleus with its ternary structure is presumably the female organ, stylized to look like a plant, in the act of fecundation, the spermatozoan is penetrating the nuclear membrane. Its role is played by the mercurial serpent, the snake is black, dark, thonic, a subterranean and ethophallic Hermes, but it has the golden wings of mercury and consequently possesses his pneumatic nature. The alchemists accordingly represented their mercurius duplex as the winged and wingless dragon, calling the former feminine and the latter masculine. 557, the serpent in our picture represents not so much the spermatozoan but, more accurately, the phallus. Leon Ebrio, in his Dialogue de Moore, calls the planet Mercury the membrum viral of heaven, that is, of the macrocosm conceived as the homo maximus. The spermatozoan seems, rather, to correspond to the golden substance which the snake is injecting into the invaginated ectoderm of the nucleus. The two silver petals, probably represent the receptive vessel, the moon bowl in which the sun's seed, gold, is destined to rest. 
Underneath the flower is a small violet circle inside the ovary, indicating by its color that it is a united double nature, spirit and body, blue and red. The snake has a pale yellow halo, which is meant to express its numinosity. 558. Since the snake evolved out of the flash of lightning or is a modulated form of it, I would like to instance a parallel where the lightning has the same illuminating, vivifying, fertilizing, transforming, and healing function that in our case falls to the snake, cf figure 3. Two phases are represented, first, a black sphere, signifying a state of profound depression, and second, the lightning that strikes into the sphere. Ordinary speech makes use of the same imagery, something strikes home in a flash of revelation. The only difference is that generally the image comes first, and only afterwards the realization which enables the patient to say, this has struck home. Figure 3. Sketch of a drawing by a young woman patient with psychogenic depression from the beginning of the treatment I state of black hopelessness slash 2. Beginning of the therapeutic effect in an earlier picture, the sphere lay on the bottom of the sea. As a series of pictures shows, it arose in the first place because a black snake had swallowed the sun. There then followed an eight-rayed, completely black mandala with a wreath of eight silver stars. In the center was a black homunculus. Next, the black sphere developed a red center, from which red rays, or streams of blood, ran out into tentacle-like extremities. The whole thing looked rather like a crab or an octopus. As the later pictures showed, the patient herself was shut up in the sphere. 559. As to the context of picture 4, Miss X emphasized that what disturbed her most was the band of quicksilver in picture 3. She felt the silvery substance ought to be inside, the black lines of force remaining outside to form a black snake. This would now encircle the sphere. She felt the snake at first as a terrible danger, as something threatening the integrity of the sphere. At the point where the snake penetrates the nuclear membrane, fire breaks out, emotion. Her conscious mind interpreted this conflagration as a defensive reaction on the part of the sphere, and accordingly, she tried to depict the attack as having been repulsed. But this attempt failed to satisfy the eyes, though she showed me a pencil sketch of it. She was obviously in a dilemma, she could not accept the snake, because its sexual significance was only too clear to her without any assistance from me. I merely remarked to her, this is a well-known process which you can safely accept, and showed her from my collection a similar picture, done by a man, of a floating sphere being penetrated from below by a black phallus-like object. Later she said, I suddenly understood the whole process in a more impersonal way. It was the realization of a law of life to which sex is subordinated. The ego was not the center, but, following a universal law, I circled round a Sunday. Thereupon she was able to accept the snake as a necessary part of the process of growth and finish the picture quickly and satisfactorily. Only one thing continued to give difficulty, she had to put the snake, she said, 100% at the top, in the middle, in order to satisfy the eyes. Evidently, the unconscious would only be satisfied with the most important position at the top and in the middle, in direct contrast to the picture I had previously shown her. This, as I said, was done by a man and showed the menacing black symbol entering the mandala from below. For a woman, the typical danger emanating from the unconscious comes from above, from the spiritual sphere personified by the animus, whereas for a man it comes from the thonic realm of the world and woman, i.e., the anima projected onto the world. 560. Once again, we must recall similar ideas found in Justin's Gnosis. The third of the fatherly angels is Baruch. He is also the tree of life in paradise. His counterpart on the motherly side is Nos, the serpent, who is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When Elohim left Edom, because, as the second member, he had retreated to the first member of the divine triad, which consisted of the good, the father, and Edom, Edom pursued the pneuma of the father, which he had left behind in man, and caused it to be tormented by Nos, Nu Alpha, Pi Sigma Alpha Iota, Cap Omicron Lambda Sigma Epsilon Iota, Cap Omicron Lambda Zeta Eta, Tau Nu Pi Nu Epsilon Upsilon Mu Alpha, Tau Omicron Upsilon E Lambda Omega Epsilon Iota Mu Tau Nu, Tau Omicron Nu Theta Omega Pi Omicron Iota, 
Nas defiled Eve and also used Adam as a catamite. Adam, however, is the soul, Elohim is spirit. The soul is against the spirit, and the spirit against the soul. Kappa Alpha Tau A with Grave Tau Psi Upsilon Chi Tau Epsilon Tau Kappa Tau Alpha Iota. This idea sheds light on the polarity of red and blue in our mandala, and also on the attack by the snake, who represents knowledge. That is why we fear knowledge of the truth, in this case, of the shadow. Therefore Baruch sent to mankind Jesus, that they might be led back to the good. But the good one is Priapus. Elohim is the swan, Adam is Leda, he the gold, she Danae. Nor should we forget that the God of Revelation has from of old the form of a snake, example, the Agatha Daemon. Adam too, as a snake maiden, has a dual nature, two-minded, two-bodied, Delta Gamma Nu Omega Mu Omicron, Delta Sigma Omega Mu Omicron, and in medieval alchemy her figure became the symbol of the androgynous Mercurius. 561. Let us remember that in picture, three Mercurius bulgy, ordinary quicksilver, encircles the sphere. This means that the mysterious sphere is enveloped or veiled by a vulgar or crude understanding. The patient herself opined that the animus veils the true personality. We shall hardly be wrong in assuming that a banal, everyday view of the world, allegedly biological, has here got hold of the sexual symbol and concretized it after the approved pattern. A pardonable error. Another, more correct view is so much more subtle that one naturally prefers to fall back on something well-known and ready to hand, thus gratifying one's own rational expectations and earning the applause of one's contemporaries, only to discover that one has got hopelessly stuck and has arrived back at the point from which one set forth on the great adventure. It is clear what is meant by the Ithophallic serpent, from above comes all that is aerial, intellectual, spiritual, and from below all that is passionate, corporeal, and dark. The snake, contrary to expectation, turns out to be a pneumatic symbol, a mercurius spiritualis, a realization which the patient herself formulated by saying that the ego, despite its capricious manipulation of sexuality, is subject to a universal law. Sex in this case is therefore no problem at all, as it has been subjected to a higher transformation process and is contained in it, not repressed, only without an object. 562, Miss X subsequently told me that she felt picture 4 was the most difficult, as if it denoted the turning point of the whole process. In my view, she may not have been wrong in this, because the clearly felt, ruthless setting aside of the so beloved and so important ego is no light matter. Not for nothing is this letting go the sign qua non of all forms of higher spiritual development, whether we call it meditation, contemplation, yoga, or spiritual exercises. But, as this case shows, relinquishing the ego is not an act of the will and not a result arbitrarily produced, it is an event, an occurrence, whose inner, compelling logic can be disguised only by willful self-deception. 563. In this case, and at this moment, the ability to let go is of decisive importance. But since everything passes, the moment may come when the relinquished ego must be reinstated in its functions. Letting go gives the unconscious the opportunity it has been waiting for. But since it consists of opposites, day and night, bright and dark, positive and negative, and is good and evil and therefore ambivalent, the moment will infallibly come when the individual, like the exemplary job, must hold fast so as not to be thrown catastrophically off balance when the wave rebounds. The holding fast can be achieved only by a conscious will, i.e., by the ego. That is the great and irreplaceable significance of the ego, but one which, as we see here, is nonetheless relative. Relative, too, is the gain won by integrating the unconscious. We add to ourselves a bright and a dark, and more light means more night. 88 The urge of consciousness towards wider horizons, however, cannot be stopped, they must needs extend the scope of the personality, if they are not to shatter it. Picture 5 564, Picture 5, Miss X said, followed naturally from Picture 4, with no difficulty. The sphere and the snake have drawn apart. The snake is sinking downwards and seems to have lost its threateningness. But the sphere has been fecundated with a vengeance. It has not only got bigger, 
but blossoms in the most vivid colors. The nucleus has divided into four, something like a segmentation has occurred. This is not due to any conscious reflection, such as might come naturally to a biologically educated person, the division of the process or of the central symbol into four has always existed, beginning with the four sons of Horus, or the four seraphim of Ezekiel, or the birth of the four eons from the metra, uterus, impregnated by the pneuma in barbellinosis, or the cross formed by the lightning, snake, in Bohm's system, 90, and ending with the tetrameria of the opus alchemicum and its components, the four elements, qualities, stages, etc. In each case, the quaternity forms a unity, here, it is the green circle, at the center of the four. The four are undifferentiated, and each of them forms a vortex, apparently turning to the left. I think I am not mistaken in regarding it as probable that, in general, a leftward movement indicates movement towards the unconscious, while a rightward, clockwise, movement goes towards consciousness. The one is sinister, the other right, rightful, correct. In Tibet, the leftward-moving swastika is a sign of the Bon religion, of black magic. Stupas and chortons must therefore be circumambulated clockwise. The leftward spinning eddies spin into the unconscious, the rightward spinning ones spin out of the unconscious chaos. The rightward moving swastika in Tibet is therefore a Buddhist emblem. CF also figure 4. 565, for our patient the process appeared to mean, first and foremost, a differentiation of consciousness. From the treasures of her psychological knowledge she interpreted the four as the four orienting functions of consciousness, thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition. She noticed, however, that the four were all alike, whereas the four functions are all unlike. This raised no question for her, but it did for me. What are these four if they are not the four functional aspects of consciousness? I doubted whether this could be a sufficient interpretation of them. They seem to be much more than that, and that is probably the reason why they are not different, but identical. They do not form four functions, different by definition, but they might well represent the a priori possibility for the formation of the four functions. In this picture we have the quaternity, the archetypal four, which is capable of numerous interpretations, as history shows and as I have demonstrated elsewhere. It illustrates the coming to consciousness of an unconscious content, hence it frequently occurs in cosmogonic myths. What is the precise significance of the fact that the four eddies are apparently turning to the left, when the division of the mandala into four denotes a process of becoming conscious, is a point about which I would rather not speculate. I lack the necessary material. Blue means air, or pneuma, and the leftward movement and intensification of the unconscious influence. Possibly this should be taken as a pneumatic compensation for the strongly emphasized red color, which signifies effectivity. Figure 4. Neolithic relief from Tarxian, Malta The spirals represent vine tendrils. 566. The mandala itself is bright red, but the four eddies have in the main a cool, greenish-blue color which the patient associated with water. This might hang together with the leftward movement, since water is a favorite symbol for the unconscious. The green of the circle in the middle signifies life in the phonic sense. It is the Benedicta Veriditas of the alchemists. 567. The problematical thing about this picture is the fact that the black snake is outside the totality of the symbolic circle. In order to make the totality actual, it ought really to be inside. But if we remember the unfavorable significance of the snake, we shall understand why its assimilation into the symbol of psychic wholeness presents certain difficulties. If our conjecture about the leftward movement of the four eddies is correct, this would denote a trend towards the deep and dark side of the spirit, by means of which the black snake could be assimilated. The snake, like the devil in Christian theology, represents the shadow, and one which goes far beyond anything personal and could therefore best be compared with a principle, such as the principle of evil. It is the colossal shadow thrown by man, of which our age had to have such a devastating experience. It is no easy matter to fit this shadow into our cosmos. The view that we can simply turn our back on evil and in this way eschew it belongs to the long list of antiquated naiveties. 
This is sheer ostrich policy, and does not affect the reality of evil, in the slightest. Evil is the necessary opposite of good, without which there would be no good either. It is impossible even to think evil out of existence. Hence the fact that the black snake remains outside expresses the critical position of evil in our traditional view of the world. 568. The background of the picture is pale, the color of parchment. I mention this fact in particular, as the pictures that follow show a characteristic change in this respect. Picture 6. 569. The background of picture 6 is a cloudy gray. The mandala itself is done in the vividest colors, bright red, green, and blue. Only where the red outer membrane enters the blue-green nucleus does the red deepen to blood color and the pale blue to a dark ultramarine. The wings of mercury, missing in the previous picture, reappear here at the neck of the blood-red pistons, as previously on the neck of the black snake in picture 4. But the most striking thing is the appearance of a swastika, undoubtedly wheeling to the right. I should add that these pictures were painted in 1928 and had no direct connection with contemporary fantasies, which at that time were still unknown to the world at large. Because of its green color, the swastika suggests something plant-like, but at the same time it has the wave-like character of the four eddies in the previous picture. 570. In this mandala an attempt is made to unite the opposites red and blue, outside and inside. Simultaneously, the rightward movement aims at bringing about an ascent into the light of consciousness, presumably because the background has become noticeably darker. The black snake has disappeared, but has begun to impart its darkness to the entire background. To compensate this, there is in the mandala an upwards movement towards the light, apparently an attempt to rescue consciousness from the darkening of the environment. The picture was associated with a dream that occurred a few days before. Miss X dreamt that she returned to the city after a holiday in the country. To her astonishment, she found a tree growing in the middle of the room where she worked. She thought, well, with its thick bark, this tree can withstand the heat of an apartment. Associations to the tree led to its maternal significance. The tree would explain the plant motif in the mandala, and its sudden growth represents the higher level or freeing of consciousness induced by the movement to the right. For the same reason, the philosophical tree is a symbol of the alchemical opus, which as we know, is an individuation process. 571, we find similar ideas in Justin's Gnosis. The angel Baruch stands for the Numa of Elohim, and the motherly angel Nos for the craftiness of Edom. But both angels, as I have said, were also trees, Baruch the tree of life, Nos the tree of knowledge. Their division and polarity are in keeping with the spirit of the times, 2nd-3rd centuries A.D. But in those days, too, they knew of an individuation process, as we can see from Hippolytus. 98 Elohim, we are told, set the prophet Heracles the task of delivering the father, the Numa, from the power of the twelve wicked angels. This resulted in his twelve labors. Now the Heracles myth has in fact all the characteristic features of an individuation process, the journeys to the four directions, 99 four sons, submission to the feminine principle, omphail, that symbolizes the unconscious, and the self-sacrifice and rebirth caused by Dianera's robe. 572, the thick bark of the tree suggests the motif of protection, which appears in the mandala as the formation of skins, separ. 576, this is expressed in the motif of the protective blackbird's wings, which shield the contents of the mandala from outside influences. The piston-shaped prolongations of the peripheral red substance are phallic symbols, indicating the entry of effectivity into the pneumatic interior. They are obviously meant to activate and enrich the spirit dwelling within. This spirit has of course nothing to do with intellect, rather with something that we would have to call spiritual substance, Numa, or, in modern terms, spiritual life. The underlying symbolical thought is no doubt the same as the view developed in the Clementine homilies, that Tatanu Epsilon Mu Alpha, spirit, and Sigma Mu Alpha, body, are one in God. Point 100 The mandala, though only a symbol of the self as the psychic totality, is at the same time a God image, for the central point, circle, and quaternity are well-known symbols for the deity. 
The impossibility of distinguishing empirically between self and God leads, in Indian theosophy, to the identity of the personal and superpersonal Purushatman. In ecclesiastical as in alchemical literature, the saying is often quoted, God is an infinite circle, or sphere, whose center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. This idea can be found in full development as early as Parmenides. I will cite the passage, because it alludes to the same motifs that underlie our mandala, for the narrower rings were filled with unmixed fire, and those next to them with night, but between these rushes the portion of flame. And in the center of these is the goddess 103 who guides everything, for throughout she rules over cruel birth and mating, sending the female to mate with the male, and conversely again the male with the female. 573 the learned Jesuit, Nicholas Cossin, apropos the report in Clement of Alexandria that, on certain occasions, wheels were rolled round in the Egyptian temples, 105 comments that Democritus of Abdera, called God 106, mentem in igni orbiculari, mind in the spherical fire. He goes on, this was the view also of Parmenides, who defined God as sigma pi finuatinu, crown, a circle, consisting of glowing light. 107 And it has been very clearly established by Iamblichus, in his book on the mysteries, that the Egyptians customarily represent God, the Lord of the world, as sitting in the lotus, a water plant, the fruits as well as the leaves of which are round, 108 thereby indicating the circular motion of the mind, which everywhere returns into itself. This is also the origin, he says, of the ritual transformations or circuits, circusiones, that imitate the motion of the heavens. But the Stoics named the heavens a round and revolving God, rotundum et volubilum deum. Kossin says it is to this that the mystical, mystis equals symbolical, explanation of Psalm 12 verse 8 refers, in circuita impii ambulant, the ungodly wander in a circle, they only walk round the periphery without ever reaching the center, which is God. Here I would mention the wheel motif in mandala symbolism only in passing, as I have dealt with it in detail elsewhere. Picture 7. 574. In Picture 7 it has indeed turned to night, the entire sheet which the mandala is painted on is black. All the light is concentrated in the sphere. The colors have lost their brightness, but have gained an intensity. It is especially striking that the black has penetrated as far as the center, so that something of what we feared has already occurred, the blackness of the snake and of the somber surroundings has been assimilated by the nucleus and, at the same time, as the picture shows, is compensated by a golden light radiating out from the center. The rays form an equal-armed cross, to replace the swastika of the previous picture, which is here represented only by four hooks suggesting a rightwards rotation. With the attainment of absolute blackness, and particularly its presence in the center, the upward movement and rightward rotation seem to have come to an end. On the other hand, the wings of Mercury have undergone a noticeable differentiation, which presumably means that the sphere has sufficient power to keep itself afloat and not sink down into total darkness. The golden rays forming the cross bind the four together. This produces an inner bond and consolidation as a defense against destructive influences emanating from the black substance that has penetrated to the center. For us the cross symbol always has the connotation of suffering, so we are probably not wrong in assuming that the mood of this picture is one of more or less painful suspension, remember the wings, over the dark abyss of inner loneliness. 575, earlier, I mentioned Bohm's lightning that makes a cross, and I brought this cross into connection with the four elements. As a matter of fact, John Dee symbolizes the elements by an equal armed cross. 113 As we said, the cross with a little circle in it is the alchemical sign for copper, cuprum, from Cyprus, Aphrodite, and the sign for Venus is. Remarkably enough, is the old apothecary's sign for Spiritus Tartari, tartaric acid, which, literally translated, means spirit of the underworld is also the sign for red hematite, bloodstone. Hence, there seems to be not only a cross that comes from above, as in Bohm's case and in Armandala, but also one that comes from below. In other words, the lightning, to keep to Bohm's image, can come from below out of the blood, from Venus or from Tartarus. Bohm's neutral salmeter is identical with salt in general, and one of the signs for this is. 
One can hardly imagine a better sign for the arcane substance, which salt was considered to be by the 16th and 17th century alchemists. Salt, in ecclesiastical as well as alchemical usage, is the symbol for sapientia and also for the distinguished or elect personality, as in Matthew 5 verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. 576, the numerous wavy lines or layers in the mandala could be interpreted as representing the formation of layers of skin, giving protection against outside influences. They serve the same purpose as the inner consolidation. These cortices probably have something to do with the dream of the tree in the workroom, which had a thick bark. The formation of skins is also found in other mandalas and it denotes a hardening or sealing off against the outside, the production of a regular rind or hide. It is possible that this phenomenon would account for the cortices or putamina, shards, mentioned in the Kabbalah. For such is the name for that which abides outside holiness, such as the seven fallen kings and the four acuraim. From them come the clippeth or cortices. As in alchemy, these are the scorii or slag, to which adheres the quality of plurality and of death. In our mandala, the cortices are boundary lines marking off the inner unity and protecting it against the outer blackness with its disintegrating influences, personified by the snake. The same motif is expressed by the petals of the lotus and by the skins of the onion, the outer layers are withered and desiccated, but they protect the softer, inner layers. The lotus seed of the horse child of the Indian divinities, and of the Buddha must be understood in this sense. Holderlin makes use of the same image, fateless, like the sleeping infant, breathe the heavenly ones, chastely guarded in modest bud, their spirits blossom eternally. 577, in Christian metaphor, Mary is the flower in which God lies hidden, or again, the rose window in which the rex glory and judge of the world is enthroned. 578, the idea of circular layers is to be found, by implication, in Bohm, for the outermost ring of his three-dimensional mandala is labeled Will of Ye Devil Lucifer, Abyss, of Eternity, Abyss of Ye Darkness, Hell of Devils, etc., see Figure 1. Bohm says of this in his Aurora, CH 17, Sector 6, Behold, when Lucifer with his hosts aroused the wrath fire in God's nature, so that God waxed wrath in nature in the place of Lucifer, the outermost birth in nature acquired another quality, wholly wrathful, dry, cold, vehement, bitter, and sour. The raging spirit, that before had a subtle, gentle quality in nature, became in his outermost birth wholly presumptuous and terrible, and now in his outermost birth is called the wind, or the element air. In this way the four elements arose, the earth, in particular, by a process of contraction and desiccation. 579, Kabbalistic influences may be conjectured here, though Bohm knew not much more about the Kabbalah than did Paracelsus. He regarded it as a species of magic. The four elements correspond to the four acuraim. They constitute a sort of second quaternity, proceeding from the inner, pneumatic quaternity, but of a physical nature. The alchemists, too, allude to the acuraim. Menens, 120 for instance, says, and although the holy name of God reveals the tetragrammaton or the four letters, yet if you should look at it aright, only three letters are found in it. The letter he, n, is found twice, since they are the same, namely air and water, which signifies the Son, earth the Father, and fire the Holy Ghost. Thus the four letters of God's name manifestly signify the most holy trinity and matter, which likewise is threefold, triplex, and which is also called the shadow of the same, i.e., of God, and is named by Moises the back of God, de posteriora, which seems to be created out of it, matter. This statement bears out Bohm's view. 580, to return to our mandala. The original four eddies have coalesced into the wavy squares in the middle of the picture. Their place is taken by golden points at the outer rim, developed from the previous picture, emitting rainbow colors. These are the colors of the peacock's eye, which play a great role as the kata pavonis in alchemy. The appearance of these colors in the opus represents an intermediate stage, preceding the definitive end result. Bohm speaks of a love desire, or a beauty of colors, and here all colors arise. In our mandala, too, the rainbow colors spring from the red layer, that means effectivity. 
of the life of nature and spirit that is united in the spherical wheeled bone says, thus is made known to us an eternal essence of nature, like to water and fire, which stand as it were mixed into one another. For there comes a bright blue color, like the lightning of the fire, and then it has a form like a ruby mingled with crystals into one essence, or like yellow, white, red, and blue mingled in dark water, for it is like blue and green, since each still has its brightness and shines, and the water only resists their fire, so that there is no wasting anywhere, but one eternal essence in two mysteries mingled together, notwithstanding the difference of two principles, viz. Two kinds of life. The phenomenon of the colors owes its existence to the imagination of the great mystery, where a wondrous essential life is born. 581. It is abundantly clear from this that Bohm was preoccupied with the same psychic phenomenon that fascinated Miss X, and many other patients too. Although Bohm took the idea of the Cauda Pavonis and the Tetrameria from alchemy, he, like the alchemists, was working on an empirical basis which has since been rediscovered by modern psychology. There are products of active imagination, and also dreams, which reproduce the same patterns and arrangements with a spontaneity that cannot be influenced. A good example is the following dream, a patient dreamt that she was in a drawing room. There was a table with three chairs beside it. An unknown man standing beside her invited her to sit down. For this purpose she fetched a fourth chair that stood further off. She then sat at the table and began turning over the pages of a book, containing pictures of blue and red cubes, as for a building game. Suddenly it occurred to her that she had something else to attend to. She left the room and went to a yellow house. It was raining in torrents, and she sought shelter under a green laurel tree. 582, the table, the three chairs, the invitation to sit down, the other chair that had to be fetched to make four chairs, the cubes, and the building game all suggest a process of composition. This takes place in stages, a combination first of blue and red, then of yellow and green. These four colors symbolize four qualities, as we have seen, which can be interpreted in various ways. Psychologically, this quaternity points to the orienting functions of consciousness, of which at least one is unconscious and therefore not available for conscious use. Here it would be the green, the sensation function, because the patient's relation to the real world was uncommonly complicated and clumsy. The inferior function, however, just because of its unconsciousness, has the great advantage of being contaminated with the collective unconscious and can be used as a bridge to span the gulf between conscious and unconscious and thus restore the vital connection with the latter. This is the deeper reason why the dream represents the inferior function as a laurel. The laurel in this dream has the same connection with the processes of inner growth as the tree that Miss X dreamt grew in her room. It is essentially the same tree as the Arbor Philosophica of the Alchemists, about which I have written in Psychology and Alchemy. We should also remember that, according to tradition, the laurel is not injured either by lightning or by cold, intact a triumphat. Hence it symbolized the Virgin Mary, the model for all women, just as Christ is the model for men. In view of its historical interpretation, the laurel, like the alchemical tree, should be taken in this context as a symbol of the self. The ingenuousness of patients who produce such dreams is always very impressive. 583. To turn back again, to our mandala. The golden lines that end in pistons recapitulate the spermatozoan motif and therefore have a spermatic significance, suggesting that the quaternity will be reproduced in a new and more distinct form. In so far as the quaternity has to do with conscious realization, we can infer from these symptoms an intensification of the latter, as is also suggested by the golden light radiating from the center probably a kind of inner illumination is meant. 584, two days before painting this picture, Miss X dreamt that she was in her father's room in their country house. But my mother had moved my bed away from the wall into the middle of the room and had slept in it. I was furious and moved the bed back to its former place. In the dream, the bed cover was red, exactly the red reproduced in the picture. 585, the mother significance of the tree in her previous dream has here been taken up by the unconscious, this time the mother has slept in the middle of the room. 
This seems to be for Miss X an annoying intrusion into her sphere, symbolized by the room of her father, who has an animus significance for her. Her sphere is therefore a spiritual one, and she has usurped it just as she usurped her father's room. She has thus identified with the spirit. Into this sphere, her mother has intruded and installed herself in the center, at first under the symbol of the tree. She therefore stands for Physis opposed to spirit, i.e., for the natural feminine being which the dreamer also is, but which she would not accept because it appeared to her as a black snake. Although she remedied the intrusion at once, the dark thonic principle, the black substance, has nevertheless penetrated to the center of her mandala, as picture 7 shows. But just because of this the golden light can appear, e tenebrous lux. We have to relate the mother to Bohm's idea of the matrix. For him the matrix is the sign, qua non of all differentiation or realization, without which the spirit remains suspended and never comes down to earth. The collision between the paternal and the maternal principle, spirit and nature, works like a shock. 586, after this picture, she felt the renewed penetration of the red color, which she associated with feeling, as something disturbing, and she now discovered that her rapport with me, her analyst, equals father, was unnatural and unsatisfactory. She was giving herself airs, she said, and was posing as an intelligent, understanding pupil, usurpation of spirituality. But she had to admit that she felt very silly, and was very silly, regardless of what I thought about it. This admission brought her a feeling of great relief and helped her to see at last that sex was not, on the one hand, merely a mechanism for producing children and not, on the other, only an expression of supreme passion, but was also banally physiological and autoerotic. This belated realization led her straight into a fantasy state where she became conscious of a series of obscene images. At the end she saw the image of a large bird, which she called the earth bird, and which alighted on the earth. Birds, as aerial beings, are well-known spirit symbols. It represented the transformation of the spiritual image of herself into a more earthy version that is more characteristic of women. This tailpiece confirms our suspicion that the intensive upward and rightward movement has come to a halt, the bird is coming down to earth. This symbolization denotes a further and necessary differentiation of what Bohm describes in general as love-desire. Through this differentiation consciousness is not only widened but also brought face to face with the reality of things, so that the inner experience is tied, so to speak, to a definite spot. 587, on the days following, the patient was overcome by feelings of self-pity. It became clear to her how much she regretted never having had any children. She felt like a neglected animal or a lost child. This mood grew into a regular Belchmerz, and she felt like the all-compassionate Tathagata, Buddha, only when she had completely given way to these feelings could she bring herself to paint another picture. Real liberation comes not from glossing over or repressing painful states of feeling, but only from experiencing them to the full. Picture 8 588, the thing that strikes us at once in Picture 8 is that almost the whole interior is filled with the black substance. The blue-green of the water has condensed to a dark blue quaternity, and the golden light in the center turns in the reverse direction, anti-clockwise, the bird is coming down to earth. That is, the mandala is moving towards the dark, thonic depths. It is still floating, the wings of Mercury show this, but it has come much closer to the blackness. The inner, undifferentiated quaternity is balanced by an outer, differentiated one, which Miss X equated with the four functions of consciousness. To these she assigned the following colors, yellow equals intuition, light blue equals thinking, flesh pink equals feeling, brown equals sensation. Each of these quarters is divided into three, thus producing the number 12 again. The separation and characterization of the two quaternities is worth noting. The outer quaternity of wings appears as a differentiated realization of the undifferentiated inner one, which really represents the archetype. In the Kabbalah this relationship corresponds to the quaternity of Merkaba on the one hand and of the Akuraim on the other, and in Bohm they are the four spirits of God and the four elements. 589, the plant-like form of the cross in the middle of the mandala, also noted by the patient, 
refers back to the tree, tree of the cross, and the mother. She thus makes it clear that this previously taboo element has been accepted and now holds the central place. She was fully conscious of this, which of course was a great advance on her previous attitude. 590. In contrast to the previous picture, there are no inner courtesies. This is a logical development, because the thing they were meant to exclude is now in the center, and defense has become superfluous. Instead, the courtesies spread out into the darkness as golden rings, expanding concentrically like waves. This would mean a far-reaching influence on the environment emanating from the sealed-off self. 591. For days, before she painted this mandala she had the following dream, I drew a young man to the window and, with a brush dipped in white oil, removed a black fleck from the cornea of his eye. A little golden lamp then became visible in the center of the pupil. The young man felt greatly relieved, and I told him he should come again for treatment. I woke up saying the words, If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. S. Matthew 6 verse 22 592, this dream describes the change, the patient is no longer identical with her animus. The animus has, so to speak, become her patient, since he has eye trouble. As a matter of fact, the animus usually sees things, cockeyed, and often very unclearly. Here a black fleck on the cornea obscures the golden light shining from inside the eye. He has seen things too blackly. The eye is the prototype of the mandala as is evident from Bohm, who calls his mandala the philosophique globe, or eye of ye wonders of eternity, or looking glass of wisdom. He says, the substance and image of the soul may be resembled to the earth, having a fair flower growing out of it, and also to the fire and light, as we see that earth is a center, but no life, yet it is essential, and a fair flower grows out of it, which is not like earth, and yet the earth is the mother of the flower. The soul is a fiery eye and similitude of the first principle, a center of nature. 593, our mandala is indeed an eye, the structure of which symbolizes the center of order in the unconscious. The eye is a hollow sphere, black inside, and filled with a semi-liquid substance, the vitreous humor. Looking at it from outside, one sees a round, colored surface, the iris, with a dark center, from which a golden light shines. Bohm calls it a fiery eye, in accordance with the old idea that seeing emanates from the eye. The eye may well stand for consciousness, which is in fact an organ of perception, looking into its own background. It sees its own light there, and when this is clear and pure, the whole body is filled with light. Under certain conditions consciousness has a purifying effect. This is probably what is meant by Matthew 6, 22 ff, an idea expressed even more clearly in Luke 11, 331i. 594, the eye is also a well-known symbol for God. Hence Bohm calls his philosophique globe the eye of eternity, the essence of all essences, the eye of God. 595, by accepting the darkness, the patient has not, to be sure, changed it into light, but she has kindled a light that illuminates the darkness within. By day no light is needed, and if you don't know it is night you won't light one, nor will any light be lit for you unless you have suffered the horror of darkness. This is not an edifying text, but a mere statement of the psychological facts. The transition from picture 7 to picture 8 gives one a working idea of what I mean by accepting the dark principle. It has sometimes been objected that nobody can form a clear conception of what this means, which is regrettable, because it is an ethical problem of the first order. Here, then, is a practical example of this acceptance, and I must leave it to the philosophers to puzzle out the ethical aspects of the process. Picture 9, 596, in Picture 9 we see for the first time the blue soul flower, on a red background, also described as such by Miss X, naturally without knowledge of bone. In the center is the golden light in the form of a lamp, as she herself stated. The courtesies are very pronounced, but they consist of light, at least in the upper half of the mandala, and radiate outwards. 143, the light is composed of the rainbow hues of the rising sun, it is a real kata pavonis. There are six sets of sunbeams. This recalls the Buddha's discourse on the robe, 
from the collection of the Pali Canon, his heart overflowing with loving kindness, with compassion, with joyfulness, with equanimity, he abides, raying forth loving kindness, compassion, joyfulness, equanimity, towards one quarter of space, then towards the second, then towards the third, then towards the fourth, and above and below, thus, all around. Everywhere, into all places the wide world over, his heart overflowing with compassion streams forth, wide, deep, illimitable, free from enmity, free from all ill will. 597, but a parallel with the Buddhist East cannot be carried through here, because the mandala is divided into an upper and a lower half. Above, the rings shine many-hued as a rainbow, below, they consist of brown earth. Above, there hover three white birds, Numida signifying the trinity, below, a goat is rising up, accompanied by two ravens, Botan's birds, 146 and twining snakes. This is not the sort of picture a Buddhist holy man would make, but that of a Western person with a Christian background, whose light throws a dark shadow. What is more, the three birds float in a jet black sky, and the goat, rising out of dark clay, is shown against a field of bright orange. This, oddly enough, is the color of the Buddhist monk's robe, which was certainly not a conscious intention of the patient. The underlying thought is clear, no white without black, and no holiness without the devil. Opposites are brothers, and the Oriental seeks to liberate himself from them by his nerdvanva, free from the two, and his neti neti, not this, not that, or else he puts up with them in some mysterious fashion, as in Taoism. The connection with the East is deliberately stressed by the patient, through her painting into the mandala four hexagrams from the I Ching. 598, the sign in the left top half is U, enthusiasm, and O. 16, it means thunder comes resounding out of the earth, i.e., a movement coming from the unconscious, and expressed by music and dancing. Confucius comments as follows, firm as a rock, what need of a whole day? The judgment can be known. The superior man knows what is hidden and what is evident. He knows weakness, he knows strength as well. Hence, the myriads look up to him. Enthusiasm can be the source of beauty, but it can also delude. 599, the second hexagram at the top is sun, decrease, and o. 41, the upper trigram means mountain, the lower trigram means lake. The mountain towers above the lake and restrains it. That is the image whose interpretation points to self-restraint and reserve, i.e., a seeming decrease of oneself. This is significant in the light of enthusiasm. In the top line of the hexagram, but, one, no longer has a separate home, the homelessness of the Buddhist monk is meant. On the psychological level, this does not, of course, refer to so drastic a demonstration of renunciation and independence, but to the patient's irreversible insight into the conditioned quality of all relationships, into the relativity of all values, and the transience of all things. 600, the sign in the bottom half to the right is Shing, pushing upward, number 46. Within the earth, wood grows, the image of pushing upward. It also says, one pushes upward into an empty city, and the king offers him Mount Chi. So this hexagram means growth and development of the personality, like a plant pushing out of the earth, a theme already anticipated by the plant motif in an earlier mandala. This is an allusion to the important lesson which Miss X has learned from her experience, that there is no development unless the shadow is accepted. 601, the hexagram to the left is Ting, the cauldron, number 50. This is a bronze sacrificial vessel equipped with handles and legs, which held the cooked viands used for festive occasions. The lower trigram means wind and wood, the upper one fire. The cauldron is thus made up of fire over wood, just as the alchemical vessel consists of fire or water. There is delicious food in it, the fat of the pheasant, but it is not eaten because the handle of the ting is altered and its legs are broken, making it unusable. But, as a result of constant self-abnegation, the personality becomes differentiated, the ting has golden carrying rings and even rings of jade, and purified, until it acquires the hardness and soft luster of precious jade. 602. Though the four hexagrams were put into the mandala on purpose, they are authentic results of preoccupation with the I Ching. 
The phases and aspects of my patient's inner process of development can therefore express themselves easily in the language of the I Ching, because it too is based on the psychology of the individuation process that forms one of the main interests of Taoism and of Zen Buddhism. Miss X's interest in Eastern philosophy was due to the deep impression which a better knowledge of her life and of herself had made upon her, an impression of the tremendous contradictions in human nature. The insoluble conflict she was faced with makes her preoccupation with Eastern therapeutic systems, which seem to get along without conflict, doubly interesting. It may be partly due to this acquaintance with the East that the opposites, irreconcilable in Christianity, were not blurred or glossed over, but were seen in all their sharpness, and in spite, or perhaps just because, of this, were brought together into the unity of the mandala. Bohm was never able to achieve this union, on the contrary, in his mandala, the bright and dark semicircles are turned back to back. The bright half is labeled H ghost, the dark half father, i.e., Octa re rummer first principle, whereas the Holy Ghost is the second principle. This polarity is crossed by the paired opposites son and earthly man. The devils are all on the side of the dark father and constitute his wrath fire, just as on the periphery of the mandala. 603 Bohm's starting point was philosophical alchemy, and to my knowledge he was the first to try to organize the Christian cosmos, as a total reality, into a mandala. The attempt failed, inasmuch as he was unable to unite the two halves in a circle. Miss X's mandala, on the other hand, comprises and contains the opposites, as a result, we may suppose, of the support afforded by the Chinese doctrine of Yang and Yin, the two metaphysical principles whose cooperation makes the world go round. The hexagrams, with their firm, Yang, and yielding, Yin, lines, illustrate certain phases of this process. It is therefore right that they should occupy a mediating position between above and below. Lao Tzu says, high stands on low. This indisputable truth is secretly suggested in the mandala, the three white birds hover in a black field, but the gray-black goat has a bright orange-colored background. Thus the oriental truth insinuates itself and makes possible, at least by symbolic anticipation, a union of opposites within the irrational life process formulated by the I Ching. That we are really concerned here with opposite phases of one and the same process is shown by the picture that now follows. Picture 10 604 in Picture 10, begun in Zurich but only completed when Miss X again visited her motherland, we find the same division as before into above and below. The soul flower in the center is the same, but it is surrounded on all sides by a dark blue night sky, in which we see the four phases of the moon, the new moon coinciding with the world of darkness below. The three birds have become two. Their plumage has darkened, but on the other hand, the goat has turned into two semi-human creatures with horns and light faces, and only two of the four snakes remain. A notable innovation is the appearance of two crabs in the lower, thonic hemisphere that also represents the body. The crab has essentially the same meaning as the astrological sign cancer. Unfortunately, Miss X gave no context here. In such cases, it is usually worth investigating what use has been made in the past of the object in question. In earlier, pre-scientific ages hardly any distinction was drawn between long-tailed crabs, macrura, crayfish, and short-tailed crabs, brachyura. As a zodiacal sign cancer signifies resurrection, because the crab sheds its shell. The ancients had in mind chiefly Pagurus bernhardus, the hermit crab. It hides in its shell and cannot be attacked. Therefore it signifies caution and foresight, knowledge of coming events. It depends on the moon and waxes with it. It is worth noting that the crab appears just in the mandala in which we see the phases of the moon for the first time. Astrologically, Cancer is the house of the moon. Because of its backwards and sideways movement, it plays the role of an unlucky animal in superstition and colloquial speech crabbed, catch a crab, etc. Since ancient times cancer, Kappa Alpha Rho Kappa Nu Omicron has been the name for a malignant tumor of the glands. Cancer is the zodiacal sign in which the sun begins to retreat when the days grow shorter. Pseudocalisthenes relates that crabs dragged Alexander's ships down into the sea. 
Carquinos was the name of the crab that bit Heracles in the foot in his fight with the Lernaean monster. In gratitude, Hera set her accomplice among the stars. 605. In astrology, Cancer is a feminine and watery sign, and the summer solstice takes place in it. In the Melithigi, it is correlated with the breast. It rules over the western sea. In Propertius it makes a sinister appearance, Octopetus cancri turga sinister time, fear thou the element back of the eight-footed crab. De Gubernatus says, the crab, causes now the death of the solar hero, and now that of the monster. The Panchatantra, v. 2, relates how a crab, which the mother gave to her son as apotropaic magic, saved his life by killing a black snake. As de Gubernatus thinks, the crab stands now for the sun and now for the moon, according to whether it goes forwards or backwards. 606. Miss X was born in the first degrees of cancer, actually about three degrees. She knew her horoscope and was well aware of the significance of the moment of birth, that is, she realized that the degree of the rising sign, the ascendant, conditions the individuality of the horoscope. Since she obviously guessed the horoscope's affinity with the mandala, she introduced her individual sign into the painting that was meant to express her psychic self. 607. The essential conclusion to be drawn from picture 10 is that the dualities which run through it are always inwardly balanced, so that they lose their sharpness and incompatibility. As Maltachali says, nothing is quite true, and even that is not quite true. But this loss of strength is counterbalanced by the unity of the center, where the lamp shines, sending out colored rays to the eight points of the compass. 608. Although the attainment of inner balance through symmetrical pairs of opposites was probably the main intention of this mandala, we should not overlook the fact that the duplication motif also occurs when unconscious contents are about to become conscious and differentiated. They then split, as often happens in dreams, into two identical or slightly different halves corresponding to the conscious and still unconscious aspects of the nascent content. I have the impression, from this picture, that it really does represent a kind of solstice or climax, where decision and division take place. The dualities are, at bottom, yes and no, the irreconcilable opposites, but they have to be held together if the balance of life is to be maintained. This can only be done by holding unswervingly to the center, where action and suffering balance each other. It is a path sharp as the edge of a razor. A climax like this, where universal opposites clash, is at the same time a moment when a wide perspective often opens out into the past and future. This is the psychological moment when, as the consensus gentium has established since ancient times, synchronistic phenomena occur, that is, when the far appears near, 16 years later, Miss X became fatally ill with cancer of the breast. Picture 11 609, here I will only mention that the colored rays emanating from the center have become so rarefied that, in the next few pictures, they disappear altogether. Sun and moon are now outside, no longer included in the microcosm of the mandala. The sun is not golden, but has a dull, ochreous hue, and in addition is clearly turning to the left, it is moving towards its own obscuration, as had to happen after the cancer picture, solstice. The moon is in the first quarter. The roundish masses near the sun are probably meant to be cumulus clouds, but with their gray-red hues, they look suspiciously like bulbous swellings. The interior of the mandala now contains a quinkinx of stars, the central star being silver and gold. The division of the mandala into an aerial and an earthy hemisphere has transferred itself to the outside world and can no longer be seen in the interior. The silvery rim of the aerial hemisphere in the preceding picture now runs round the entire mandala and recalls the band of quicksilver that, as Mercurius vulgaris, veils the true personality. At all events, it is probable that the influence and importance of the outside world are becoming so strong in this picture as to bring about an impairment and devaluation of the mandala. It does not break down or burst, as can easily happen under similar circumstances, but is removed from the telluric influence through the symbolical constellation of stars and heavenly bodies. Picture 12-24 610 
In picture 12, the sun is in fact sinking below the horizon, and the moon is coming out of the first quarter. The radiation of the mandala has ceased altogether, but the equivalents of sun and moon, and also of the earth, have been assimilated into it. A remarkable feature is its sudden inner animation by two human figures and various animals. The constellation character of the center has vanished and given way to a kind of flower motif. What this animation means cannot be established, unfortunately, as we have no commentary. 611, in picture 13, the source of radiation is no longer in the mandala but outside, in the shape of the full moon, from which rings of rainbow-colored light radiate in concentric circles. The mandala is laced together by four black and golden snakes, the heads of three of them pointing to the center, while the fourth rears upwards. In between the snakes and the center, there are indications of the spermatozoan motif. This may mean an intensive penetration on the part of the outside world, but it could also mean magical protection. The breaking down of the quaternity into three plus one is in accord with the archetype. 612, in picture 14, the mandala is suspended over the lit-up ravine of Fifth Avenue, New York, with her Miss X in the meantime returned. On the blue flower in the center the Konyangsho of the royal pair is represented by the sacrificial fire burning between them. The king and queen are assisted by two kneeling figures of a man and a woman. It is a typical marriage quaternio, and for an understanding of its psychology I must refer the reader to my account in The Psychology of the Transference. This inner bond should be thought of as a compensatory consolidation against disintegrating influences from without. 613, in picture 15, the mandala floats between Manhattan and the sea. It is daylight again, and the sun is just rising. Out of the blue center blue snakes penetrate into the red flesh of the mandala, the enantiodromia is setting in, after the introversion of feeling caused by the shock of New York had passed its climax. The blue color of the snakes indicates that they have acquired a pneumatic nature. 614, from picture 16 onwards, the drawing and painting technique shows a decided improvement. The mandalas gain in aesthetic value. In picture 17, a kind of eye motif appears, which I have also observed in the mandalas of other persons. It seems to me to link up with the motif of polyophthalmia and to point to the peculiar nature of the unconscious, which can be regarded as a multiple consciousness. I have discussed this question in detail elsewhere. See also Figure 5. Figure 5. Mandala by a woman patient aged 58, artistic and technically accomplished. In the center is the egg encircled by the snake, outside, apotropaic wings and eyes. The mandala is exceptional in that it has a pentatic structure. The patient also produced triadic mandalas. She was fond of playing with forms irrespective of their meaning, a consequence of her artistic gift. 615, the enantiodromia only reached its climax the following year, in picture 19 in that picture, the red substance is arranged round the golden, forayed star in the center, and the blue substance is pushing everywhere to the periphery. Here the rainbow-colored radiation of the mandala begins again for the first time, and from then on was maintained for over 10 years, in mandalas not reproduced here. 616, I will not comment on the subsequent pictures, nor reproduce them all, as I say, they extend over more than 10 years, because I feel I do not understand them properly. In addition, they came into my hands only recently, after the death of the patient, and unfortunately without text or commentary. Under these circumstances, the work of interpretation becomes very uncertain, and is better left unattempted. Also, this case was meant only as an example of how such pictures come to be produced, what they mean, and what reflections and observations their interpretation requires. It is not intended to demonstrate how an entire lifetime expresses itself in symbolic form. The individuation process has many stages and is subject to many vicissitudes, as the fictive course of the Opus Alchemicum amply shows. Conclusion 617, our series of pictures illustrates the initial stages of the way of individuation. It would be desirable to know what happens afterwards. 
But, just as neither the philosophical gold nor the philosopher's stone was ever made in reality, so nobody has ever been able to tell the story of the whole way, at least not to mortal ears, for it is not the storyteller, but death, who speaks the final, consummatum est. Certainly there are many things worth knowing in the later stages of the process, but, from the point of view of teaching as well as of therapy, it is important not to skip too quickly over the initial stages. As these pictures are intuitive anticipations of future developments, it is worth while lingering over them for a long time, in order, with their help, to integrate so many contents of the unconscious into consciousness that the latter really does reach the stage it sees ahead. These psychic evolutions do not as a rule keep pace with the tempo of intellectual developments. Indeed, their very first goal is to bring a consciousness that has hurried too far ahead into contact again with the unconscious background with which it should be connected. This was the problem in our case too. Miss X had to turn back to her motherland in order to find her Earth again, the Stygia Retro. It is a task that today faces not only individuals but whole civilizations. What else is the meaning of the frightful regressions of our time? The tempo of the development of consciousness through science and technology was too rapid and left the unconscious, which could no longer keep up with it, far behind, thereby forcing it into a defensive position which expresses itself in a universal will to destruction. The political and social isms of our day preach every conceivable ideal, but, under this mask, they pursue the goal of lowering the level of our culture by restricting or altogether inhibiting the possibilities of individual development. They do this partly by creating a chaos controlled by terrorism, a primitive state of affairs that affords only the barest necessities of life and surpasses in horror the worst times of the so-called Dark Ages. It remains to be seen whether this experience of degradation and slavery will once more raise a cry for greater spiritual freedom. 618. This problem cannot be solved collectively, because the masses are not changed unless the individual changes. At the same time, even the best-looking solution cannot be forced upon him, since it is a good solution only when it is combined with a natural process of development. It is therefore a hopeless undertaking to stake everything on collective recipes and procedures. The bettering of a general ill begins with the individual, and then only when he makes himself and not others responsible. This is naturally only possible in freedom, but not under a rule of force, whether this be exercised by a self-elected tyrant or by one thrown up by the mob. 619, the initial pictures in our series illustrate the characteristic psychic processes, which said in the moment one gives a mind to that part of the personality which has remained behind, forgotten. Scarcely has the connection been established when symbols of the self appear, trying to convey a picture of the total personality. As a result of this development, the unsuspecting modern gets into paths trodden from time immemorial, the via sancta, whose milestones and signposts are the religions. He will think and feel things that seem strange to him, not to say unpleasant. Apuleius relates that in the Isis mysteries he approached the very gates of death and set one foot on Proserpina's threshold, yet was permitted to return, wrapped through all the elements. At midnight I saw the sun shining as if it were noon, I entered the presence of the gods of the underworld and the gods of the upper world, stood near and worshipped them. Such experiences are also expressed in our mandalas, that is why we find in religious literature the best parallels to the symbols and moods of the situations they formulate. These situations are intense inner experiences which can lead to lasting psychic growth and a ripening and deepening of the personality, if the individual affected by them has the moral capacity for pi sigma tau pi, loyal trust and confidence. They are the age-old psychic experiences that underlie faith and ought to be its unshakable foundation, and not of faith alone, but also of knowledge. 620. Our case shows with singular clarity the spontaneity of the psychic process and the transformation of a personal situation into the problem of individuation, that is, of becoming whole which is the answer to the great question of our day, how can consciousness, our most recent acquisition, which has bounded ahead, be linked up again with the oldest, the unconscious, which has lagged behind? The oldest of all is the instinctual foundation. 
Anyone who overlooks the instincts will be ambuscaded by them, and anyone who does not humble himself will be humbled, losing at the same time his freedom, his most precious possession. 621. Always when science tries to describe a simple life process, the matter becomes complicated and difficult. So it is no wonder that the details of a transformation process rendered visible through active imagination make no small demands on our understanding. In this respect, they may be compared with all other biological processes. These, too, require specialized knowledge to become comprehensible. Our example also shows, however, that this process can begin and run its course without any special knowledge having to stand sponsored to it. But if one wants to understand anything of it and assimilate it into consciousness, then a certain amount of knowledge is needed. If the process is not understood at all, it has to build up an unusual intensity so as not to sink back again into the unconscious without result. But if its affects rise to an unusual pitch, they will enforce some kind of understanding. It depends on the correctness of this understanding whether the consequences turn out more pathologically or less. Psychic experiences, according to whether they are rightly or wrongly understood, have very different effects on a person's development. It is one of the duties of the psychotherapist to acquire such knowledge of these things as will enable him to help his patient to an adequate understanding. Experiences of this kind are not without their dangers, for they are also, among other things, the matrix of the psychoses. Stiff-necked and violent interpretations should under all circumstances be avoided, likewise a patient should never be forced into a development that does not come naturally and spontaneously. But once it is set in, he should not be talked out of it again, unless the possibility of a psychosis has been definitely established. Thorough psychiatric experience is needed to decide this question, and it must constantly be borne in mind that the constellation of archetypal images and fantasies is not in itself pathological. The pathological element only reveals itself in the way the individual reacts to them and how he interprets them. The characteristic feature of a pathological reaction is, above all, identification with the archetype. This produces a sort of inflation and possession by the emergent contents, so that they pour out in a torrent which no therapy can stop. Identification can, in favorable cases, sometimes pass off as a more or less harmless inflation. But in all cases identification with the unconscious brings a weakening of consciousness, and herein lies the danger. You do not make an identification, you do not identify yourself but you experience your identity with the archetype in an unconscious way and so are possessed by it. Hence in more difficult cases it is far more necessary to strengthen and consolidate the ego than to understand and assimilate the products of the unconscious. The decision must be left to the diagnostic and therapeutic tact of the analyst. Asterisk. 622, this paper is a groping attempt to make the inner processes of the mandala more intelligible. They are, as it were, self-delineations of dimly sensed changes going on in the background, which are perceived by the reversed eye and rendered visible with pencil and brush, just as they are, uncomprehended and unknown. The pictures represent a kind of ideogram of unconscious contents. I have naturally used this method on myself too, and can affirm that one can paint very complicated pictures without having the least idea of their real meaning. While painting them, the picture seems to develop out of itself and often in opposition to one's conscious intentions. It is interesting to observe how the execution of the picture frequently thwarts one's expectations in the most surprising way. The same thing can be observed, sometimes even more clearly, when writing down the products of active imagination. 623. The present work may also serve to fill a gap I myself have felt in my exposition of therapeutic methods. I have written very little on active imagination, but have talked about it a great deal. I have used this method since 1916, and I sketched it out for the first time in the relations between the ego and the unconscious. I first mentioned the mandala in 1929, in the secret of the golden flower. 176, for at least 13 years I kept quiet about the results of these methods in order to avoid any suggestion. I wanted to assure myself that these things, mandalas especially, really are produced spontaneously and were not suggested to the patient by my own fantasy. 
I was then able to convince myself, through my own studies, that mandalas were drawn, painted, carved in stone, and built, at all times and in all parts of the world, long before my patients discovered them. I have also seen to my satisfaction that mandalas are dreamt and drawn by patients who were being treated by psychotherapists whom I had not trained. In view of the importance and significance of the mandala symbol, special precautions seem to be necessary, seeing that this motif is one of the best examples of the universal operation of an archetype. In a seminar on children's dreams, which I held in 1939-40, I mentioned the dream of a ten-year-old girl who had absolutely no possibility of ever hearing about the quaternity of God. The dream was written down by the child herself and was sent to me by an acquaintance, once in a dream I saw an animal that had lots of horns. It spiked up other little animals with them. It wriggled like a snake and that was how it lived. Then a blue fog came out of all the four corners, and it stopped eating. Then God came, but there were really four gods in the four corners. Then the animal died, and all the animals it had eaten came out alive again. 624 This dream describes an unconscious individuation process. All the animals are eaten by the one animal. Then comes the enantiodromia, the dragon changes into Numa, which stands for a divine quaternity. Thereupon follows the apocatastasis, a resurrection of the dead. This exceedingly unchildish fantasy can hardly be termed anything but archetypal. Miss X, in picture 12, also put a whole collection of animals into her mandala, two snakes, two tortoises, two fishes, two lions, two pigs, a goat and a ram. Integration gathers many into one. To the child who had this dream, and to Miss X likewise, it was certainly not known that Origen had already said, Speaking of the sacrificial animals, seek these sacrifices within thyself, and thou wilt find them within thine own soul. Understand that thou hast within thyself flocks of cattle, flocks of sheep and flocks of goats. Understand that the birds of the sky are also within thee. Marvel not if we say that these are within thee, but understand that thou thyself art even another little world, and hast within thee the sun and the moon, and also the stars. 625 The same idea occurs again in another passage, but this time it takes the form of a psychological statement, for look upon the countenance of a man who is at one moment angry, at the next sad, a short while afterward joyful, then troubled again, and then contented. See how he who thinks himself one is not one, but seems to have as many personalities as he has moods, as also the scripture says, a fool is changed as the moon, 180 God, therefore, is unchangeable, and is called one for the reason that he changes not. Thus also the true imitator of God, who is made after God's image, is called one and the selfsame, unice t ipsi, when he comes to perfection, for he also, when he is fixed on the summit of virtue, is not changed, but remains always one. For every man, whilst he is in wickedness, malatia, is divided among many things, and torn in many directions, and while he is in many kinds of evil, he cannot be called one. 626. Here the many animals are effective states to which man is prone. The individuation process, clearly alluded to in this passage, subordinates the many to the one. But the one is God, and that which corresponds to him in us is the Imago Dei, the God image. But the God image, as we saw from Jacob Bohm, expresses itself in the mandala. Concerning mandala symbolism, 627 In what follows I shall try to describe a special category of symbols, the mandala, with the help of a wide selection of pictures. I have dealt with this theme on several occasions before, and in psychology and alchemy I gave a detailed account, with running commentary, of the mandala symbols that came up in the course of an individual analysis. I repeated the attempt in the preceding paper of the present volume but there the mandalas did not derive from dreams but from active imagination. In this paper I shall present mandalas of the most varied provenance, on the one hand to give the reader an impression of the astonishing wealth of forms produced by individual fantasy, and on the other hand to enable him to form some idea of the regular occurrence of the basic elements. 628 as regards the interpretation, I must refer the reader to the literature. In this paper I shall content myself with hints, because a more detailed explanation would lead much too far, as the mandalas described in psychology and religion and in the preceding paper of this volume show. 
629, the Sanskrit word mandala means circle. It is the Indian term for the circles drawn in religious rituals. In the great temple of Madura, in southern India, I saw how a picture of this kind was made. It was drawn by a woman on the floor of the mandapam, porch, in colored chalks, and measured about ten feet across. A pundit who accompanied me said in reply to my questions that he could give me no information about it. Only the women who drew such pictures knew what they meant. The woman herself was non-committal, she evidently did not want to be disturbed in her work. Elaborate mandalas, executed in red chalk, can also be found on the whitewashed walls of many huts. The best and most significant mandalas are found in the sphere of Tibetan Buddhism. I shall use as an example a Tibetan mandala, to which my attention was drawn by Richard Wilhelm. Figure 1 630, a mandala of this sort is known in ritual usage as a yantra, an instrument of contemplation. It is meant to aid concentration by narrowing down the psychic field of vision and restricting it to the center usually the mandala contains three circles, painted in black or dark blue. They are meant to shut out the outside and hold the inside together. Almost regularly, the outer rim consists of fire, the fire of concupiscentia, desire, from which proceed the torments of hell. The horrors of the burial ground are generally depicted on the outer rim. Inside this is a garland of lotus leaves, characterizing the whole mandala as a padma, lotus flower. Then comes a kind of monastery courtyard with four gates. It signifies sacred seclusion and concentration. Inside this courtyard there are as a rule the four basic colors, red, green, white, and yellow, which represent the four directions and also the psychic functions, as the Tibetan Book of the Dead Three shows. Then, usually marked off by another magic circle, comes the center as the essential object or goal of contemplation. 631. This center is treated in very different ways, depending on the requirements of the ritual, the grade of initiation of the contemplator, and the sect he belongs to. As a rule, it shows Shiva in his world-creating emanations. Shiva, according to Tantric doctrine, is the one existent, the timeless, in its perfect state. Creation begins when this unextended point, known as Shiva Bindu, appears in the eternal embrace of its feminine side, the Shakti. It then emerges from the state of being in itself and attains the state of being for itself, if I may use the Hegelian terminology. 632. In Kundalini Yoga symbolism, Shakti is represented as a snake wound three and a half times round the lingam, which is Shiva in the form of a phallus. This image shows the possibility of manifestation in space. From Shakti comes Maya, the building material of all individual things, she is, in consequence, the creatrix of the real world. This is thought of as illusion, as being and not being. It is, and yet remains dissolved in Shiva. Creation therefore begins with an act of division of the opposites that are united in the deity. From their splitting arises, in a gigantic explosion of energy, the multiplicity of the world. 633. The goal of contemplating the processes depicted in the mandala is that the yogi shall become inwardly aware of the deity. Through contemplation, he recognizes himself as God again, and thus returns from the illusion of individual existence into the universal totality of the divine state. 634. As I have said, mandala means circle. There are innumerable variants of the motif shown here but they are all based on the squaring of a circle. Their basic motif is the premonition of a center of personality, a kind of central point within the psyche, to which everything is related, by which everything is arranged, and which is itself a source of energy. The energy of the central point is manifested in the almost irresistible compulsion and urge to become what one is, just as every organism is driven to assume the form that is characteristic of its nature, no matter what the circumstances. This center is not felt or thought of as the ego, but, if one may so express it, as the self. Although the center is represented by an innermost point, it is surrounded by a periphery containing everything that belongs to the self, the paired opposites that make up the total personality. This totality comprises consciousness first of all, then the personal unconscious, 
and finally an indefinitely large segment of the collective unconscious whose archetypes are common to all mankind. A certain number of these, however, are permanently or temporarily included within the scope of the personality and, through this contact, acquire an individual stamp as the shadow, anima, and animus, to mention only the best-known figures. The self, though on the one hand simple, is on the other hand an extremely composite thing, a conglomerate soul, to use the Indian expression. 635, Lamaic literature gives very detailed instructions as to how such a circle must be painted and how it should be used. Form and color are laid down by tradition, so the variants move within fairly narrow limits. The ritual use of the mandala is actually non-Buddhist, at any rate it is alien to the original Hinayana Buddhism and appears first in Mahayana Buddhism. 636, the mandala shown here, depicts the state of one who has emerged from contemplation into the absolute state. That is why representation of hell and the horrors of the burial ground are missing. The diamond thunderbolt, the dorge in the center, symbolizes the perfect state where masculine and feminine are united. The world of illusions has finally vanished. All energy has gathered together in the initial state. 637, the four dorges in the gates of the inner courtyard are meant to indicate that life's energy is streaming inwards, it has detached itself from objects and now returns to the center. When the perfect union of all energies in the four aspects of wholeness is attained, there arises a static state subject to no more change. In Chinese alchemy this state is called the diamond body, corresponding to the corpus incorruptible of medieval alchemy which is identical with the corpus glorificationis of Christian tradition, the incorruptible body of resurrection. This mandala shows, then, the union of all opposites, and is embedded between yang and yin, heaven and earth, the state of everlasting balance and immutable duration. 638, for our more modest psychological purposes, we must abandon the colorful metaphysical language of the East. What yoga aims at in this exercise is undoubtedly a psychic change in the adept. The ego is the expression of individual existence. The yogin exchanges his ego for Shiva or the Buddha, in this way he induces a shifting of the psychological center of personality from the personal ego to the impersonal non-ego, which is now experienced as the real ground of the personality. 639, in this connection I would like to mention a similar Chinese conception namely, the system on which the I Ching is based. Figure 2 640, in the center is Chien, heaven, from which the four emanations go forth, like the heavenly forces extending through space. Thus we have, Chien, self-generated creative energy, corresponding to Shiva. Hung, all-pervading power. Yuan, generative power. Li, beneficent power. Qing, unchangeable, determinative power. 641, round this masculine power center lies the earth with its formed elements. It is the same conception as the Shiva Shakti union in Kundalini Yoga, but here represented as the earth receiving into itself the creative power of heaven. The union of heaven with Kuan, the feminine and receptive, produces the Tetractes, which, as in Pythagoras, underlies all existence. 642, the river map is one of the legendary foundations of the I Ching, which in its present form derives partly from the 12th century BC. According to the legend, a dragon dredged the magical signs of the river map from a river. On it, the sages discovered the drawing, and in the drawing the laws of the world order. This drawing, in accordance with its extreme age, shows the knotted cords that signify numbers. These numbers have the usual primitive character of qualities, chiefly masculine and feminine. All uneven numbers are masculine, even numbers feminine. 643, unfortunately, I do not know whether this primitive conception influenced the formation of the much younger tantric mandala. But the parallels are so striking that the European investigator has to ask himself, which view influenced the other? Did the Chinese develop from the Indian, or the Indian from the Chinese? An Indian whom I asked answered, naturally the Chinese developed from the Indian. But he did not know how old the Chinese conceptions are. The bases of the I Ching go back to the 3rd millennium BC. 
My late friend Richard Wilhelm, the eminent expert on classical Chinese philosophy, was of the opinion that no direct connections could be assumed. Nor, despite the fundamental similarity of the symbolic ideas, does there need to be any direct influence since the ideas, as experience shows and as I think I have demonstrated, arise autochthonously again and again, independently of one another, out of a psychic matrix that seems to be ubiquitous. Figure 3 644, as a counterpart to the Lamaic mandala, I now reproduce the Tibetan world wheel, which should be sharply distinguished from the former, since it represents the world. In the center are the three principles, cock, snake, and pig, symbolizing lust, envy, and unconsciousness. The wheel has, near the center, six spokes, and twelve spokes round the edge. It is based on a triadic system. The wheel is held by the god of death, Yama. Later, we shall meet other shield holders, figures 34 and 47. It is understandable that the sorrowful world of old age, sickness, and death should be held in the claws of the death demon. The incomplete state of existence is, remarkably enough, expressed by a triadic system, and the complete, spiritual, state by a tetradic system. The relation between the incomplete and the complete state therefore corresponds to the sesquitertian proportion of 3, 4. This relation is known in Western alchemical tradition as the axiom of Maria. It also plays a not inconsiderable role in dream symbolism. For asterisk 645, we shall now pass on to individual mandalas spontaneously produced by patients in the course of an analysis of the unconscious. Unlike the mandalas so far discussed, these are not based on any tradition or model, seeming to be free creations of fantasy, but determined by certain archetypal ideas unknown to their creators. For this reason, the fundamental motifs are repeated so often that marked similarities occur in drawings done by the most diverse patients. The pictures come as a rule from educated persons who were unacquainted with the ethnic parallels. The pictures differ widely according to the stage of the therapeutic process, but certain important stages correspond to definite motifs. Without going into therapeutic details, I would only like to say that a rearranging of the personality is involved, a kind of new centering. That is why mandalas mostly appear in connection with chaotic psychic states of disorientation or panic. They then have the purpose of reducing the confusion to order, though this is never the conscious intention of the patient. At all events, they express order, balance, and wholeness. Patients themselves often emphasize the beneficial or soothing effect of such pictures. Usually, the mandalas express religious, i.e., numinous, thoughts and ideas, or, in their stead, philosophical ones. Most mandalas have an intuitive, irrational character and, through their symbolical content, exert a retroactive influence on the unconscious. They therefore possess a magical significance, like icons, whose possible efficacy was never consciously felt by the patient. In fact, it is from the effect of their own pictures that patients discover what icons can mean. Their pictures work not because they spring from the patient's own fantasy, but because they are impressed by the fact that their subjective imagination produces motifs and symbols of the most unexpected kind that conform to law and express an idea or situation which their conscious mind can grasp only with difficulty. Confronted with these pictures, many patients suddenly realize, for the first time, the reality of the collective unconscious as an autonomous entity. I will not labor the point here. The strength of the impression and its effect on the patient are obvious enough from some of the pictures. 646. I must preface the pictures that now follow with a few remarks on the formal elements of mandala symbolism. These are primarily 1. Circular, spherical, or egg-shaped formation. 2. The circle is elaborated into a flower, rose, lotus, or a wheel. 3. A center expressed by a sun, star, or cross, usually with 4, 8, or 12 rays. 4. The circles, spheres, and cruciform figures are often represented in rotation, swastika. 5. The circle is represented by a snake coiled about a center, either ring-shaped, uroboros, or spiral, orphic egg. 
6. Squaring of the circle, taking the form of a circle, in a square, or vice versa. 7. Castle, city, and courtyard, taminos, motifs, quadratic or circular. 8. I, pupil and iris. 9. Besides the tetratic figures, and multiples of 4, there are also triadic and pentatic ones, though these are much rarer. They should be regarded as disturbed totality pictures, as we shall see below. Figure 4 647. This mandala was done by a woman patient in her middle years, who first saw it in a dream. Here we see at once the difference from the Eastern mandala. It is poor in form, poor in ideas, but nevertheless expresses the individual attitude of the patient far more clearly than the Eastern pictures which had been subjected to a collective and traditional configuration. Her dream ran, I was trying to decipher an embroidery pattern. My sister knew how. I asked her if she had made an elaborate hemstitched handkerchief. She said, no, but I know how it was done. Then I saw it with the threads drawn, but the work not yet done. One must go around and around the square until near the center, then go in circles. 648. The spiral is painted in the typical colors red, green, yellow, and blue. According to the patient, the square in the center represents a stone, its four facets showing the four basic colors. The inner spiral represents the snake that, like Kundalini, wins three and a half times round the center. 649. The dreamer herself had no notion of what was going on in her, namely the beginning of a new orientation, nor would she have understood it consciously. Also, the parallels from Eastern symbolism were completely unknown to her, so that any influence is out of the question. The symbolic picture came to her spontaneously, when she had reached a certain point in her development. 650. It is, unfortunately, not possible for me to say exactly under what circumstances each of these pictures arose. That would lead us too far. The sole aim of this paper is to give a survey of the formal parallels to the individual and collective mandala. I regret also that for the same reason no single picture can be interpreted circumstantially and in detail, as that would inevitably require a comprehensive account of the analytical situation of the patient. Wherever it is possible to shed light on the origins of the picture by a passing hint, as in the present case, I shall do so. 651 as to the interpretation of the picture, it must be emphasized that the snake, arranged in angles and then in circles round the square, signifies the circumambulation of, and way to, the center. The snake, as a thonic and at the same time spiritual being, symbolizes the unconscious. The stone in the center, presumably a cube, is the quaternary form of the lapis philosophorum. The four colors also point in this direction. It is evident that the stone in this case signifies the new center of personality, the self, which is also symbolized by a vessel. Figure 5. 652. The painter was a middle-aged woman of schizoid disposition. She had several times drawn mandalas spontaneously, because they always had an ordering effect on her chaotic psychic states. The picture shows a rose, the western equivalent of the lotus. In India the lotus flower, Padma, is interpreted by the Tantrists as the womb. We know this symbol from the numerous pictures of the Buddha and other Indian deities in the lotus flower. 7. It corresponds to the golden flower of Chinese alchemy, the rose of the Rosicrucians, and the mystic rose in Dante's Paradiso. Rose and lotus are usually arranged in groups of four petals, indicating the squaring of the circle or the united opposites. The significance of the rose as the maternal womb was nothing strange to our Western mystics, for we read in a prayer inspired by the litany of Loretto, O rose wreath, thy blossoming makes men weep for joy. O rosy sun, thy burning makes men to love. O son of the sun, rose child, sunbeam. Flower of the cross, pure womb that blossoms over all blooming and burning, sacred rose, Mary. 653 at the same time, the vessel motif is an expression of the content, just as Shakti represents the actualization of Shiva. As alchemy shows, the self is androgynous and consists of a masculine and a feminine principle. 
Conrad of Würzburg speaks of Mary, the flower of the sea in which Christ lies hidden. And in an old hymn we read, O'er all the heavens a rose appears, and a bright dress of blossom wears. Its light glows in the three-in-one for God himself has put it on. Figure 6. 654. The rose in the center is depicted as a ruby, its outer ring being conceived as a wheel or a wall with gates, so that nothing can come out from inside or go in from outside. The mandala was a spontaneous product from the analysis of a male patient. It was based on a dream, the dreamer found himself with three younger traveling companions in Liverpool. 8. It was night, and raining. The air was full of smoke and soot. They climbed up from the harbor to the upper city. The dreamer said, it was terribly dark and disagreeable, and we could not understand how anyone could stick it here. We talked about this, and one of my companions said that, remarkably enough, a friend of his had settled here, which astonished everybody. During this conversation we reached a sort of public garden in the middle of the city. The park was square, and in the center was a lake or large pool. A few street lamps just lit up the pitch darkness, and I could see a little island in the pool. On it there was a single tree, a red flowering magnolia, which miraculously stood in everlasting sunshine. I noticed that my companions had not seen this miracle, whereas I was beginning to understand why the man had settled here. 655, the dreamer went on, I tried to paint this dream. But as so often happens, it came out rather different. The magnolia turned into a sort of rose made of ruby-colored glass. It shone like a forayed star. The square represents the wall of the park and at the same time a street leading round the park in a square. From it there radiate eight main streets, and from each of these eight side streets, which meet in a shining red central point, rather like the Etoile in Paris. The acquaintance mentioned in the dream lived in a house at the corner of one of these stars. The mandala thus combines the classic motifs of flower, star, circle, precinct, taminos, and plan of city, divided into quarters, with citadel. The whole thing seemed like a window opening on to eternity, wrote the dreamer. Figure 7 656, flower motif, with cross in the center. The square, too, is arranged like a flower. The four faces at the corners correspond to the four cardinal points which are often depicted as four deities. Here they have a demonic character. This may be connected with the fact that the patient was born in the Dutch East Indies, where she sucked up the peculiar local demonology with the mother's milk of her native Aya. Her numerous drawings all had a distinctly Eastern character, and thereby helped her to assimilate influences that at first could not be reconciled with her Western mentality. 657 in the picture that followed, the demon faces were ornamentally elaborated in eight directions. For the superficial observer, the flower-like character of the whole may disguise the demonic element the mandala is meant to ward off. The patient felt that the demonic effect came from the European influence with its moralism and rationalism. Brought up in the East Indies until her sixth year, she came later into a conventional European milieu and this had a devastating effect on the flower-like quality of her eastern spirit and caused a prolonged psychic trauma. Under treatment her native world, long submerged, came up again in these drawings, bringing with it psychic recovery. Figure 8 658, the flower-like development has got stronger and is beginning to overgrow the demonishness of the faces. Figure 9 659, a later stage is shown here. Minute care in the draftsmanship vies with richness of color and form. From this we can discern not only the extraordinary concentration of the patient, but the triumph of Eastern flower-likeness over the demon of Western intellectualism, rationalism, and moralism. At the same time, the new centering of the personality becomes visible. Figure 10. 660, in this painting, done by another young woman patient, we see at the cardinal points four creatures, a bird, a sheep, a snake, and a lion with a human face. Together with the four colors in which the four regions are painted, they embody four principles. The interior of the mandala is empty. Or rather, it contains of nothing that is expressed by a quaternity. 
This is in accord with the overwhelming majority of individual mandalas, as a rule the center contains the motif of the rotundum, known to us from alchemy, or the fourfold emanation or the squaring of the circle, or, more rarely, the figure of the patient in a universal human sense, representing the anthropos. We find this motif, too, in alchemy. The four animals remind us of the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision, and also of the four symbols of the evangelists and the four sons of Horus, which are sometimes depicted in the same way, three with animal heads and one with a human head. Animals generally signify the instinctive forces of the unconscious, which are brought into unity within the mandala. This integration of the instincts is a prerequisite for individuation. Figure 11. 661, painting by an older patient. Here the flower is seen not in the basic pattern of the mandala, but in elevation. The circular form has been preserved inside the square, so that despite its different execution, this picture can still be regarded as a mandala. The plant stands for growth and development, like the green shoot in the diaphragm chakra of the Kundalini Yoga system. The shoot symbolizes Shiva and represents the center and the male whereas the calyx represents the female, the place of germination and birth. 11. Thus the Buddha sitting in the lotus is shown as the germinating god. It is the god in his rising, the same symbol as Are the falcon, or the phoenix rising from the nest, or Mithras in the treetop, or the horse child in the lotus. They are all symbolizations of the status nascendi in the seating place of the matrix. In medieval hymns Mary too is praised as the cup of the flower in which Christ, coming down as a bird, makes his nest. Psychologically Christ means unity, which clothes itself in the corpus mysticum of the church or in the body of the mother of God, mystic rose, surrounded as with flower petals, and thus reveals itself in reality. Christ as an image is a symbol of the self. 12. Just as the plant stands for growth, so the flower depicts the unfolding from a center. Figure 12. 662. Here, the four rays emanating from the center spread across the whole picture. This gives the center a dynamic character. The structure of the flower is a multiple of four. The picture is typical of the marked personality of the patient, who had some artistic talent. She also painted figure 5. Besides that, she had a strong feeling for Christian mysticism, which played a great role in her life. It was important for her to experience the archetypal background of Christian symbolism. Figure 13. 663. Photograph of a rug woven by a middle-aged woman, Penelope-like, at a time of great inner and outer distress. She was a doctor and she wove this magic circle round herself, working at it every day for months, as a counterbalance to the difficulties of her life. She was not my patient and could not have been influenced by me. The rug contains an eight-petaled flower. A special feature of the rug is that it has a reel above and below. Above is light, below, relative darkness. In it, there is a creature like a beetle, representing an unconscious content, and comparable with the sun in the form of Kepra. Occasionally, the above and below are outside the protective circle, instead of inside. In that case, the mandala affords protection against extreme opposites. That is, the sharpness of the conflict is not yet realized or else is felt as intolerable. The protective circle then guards against possible disruption due to the tension of opposites. Figure 14 664, an Indian picture of Shiva Bindu, the unextended point. It shows the divine power before the creation, the opposites are still united. The god rests in the point. Hence the snake signifies extension, the mother of becoming, the creation of the world of forms. In India, this point is also called Hiraniagarbha, golden germ or golden egg. We read in the Sanatsagasha, that pure great light which is radiant, that great glory which the gods worship, which makes the sun shine forth, that divine, eternal being is perceived by the faithful. Figure 15 665, this picture also by a middle-aged woman patient, shows the squaring of the circle. The plants again denote germination and growth. In the center is a sun. As the snake entry motif shows, we have here a conception of paradise. 
A parallel is the Gnostic conception of Edem with the four rivers of paradise in the Nasi Gnosis. For the functional significance of the snake in relation to the mandala, see the preceding paper, comments on pictures 3, 4, and 5. Figure 16. 666. This picture was painted by a neurotic young woman. The snake is somewhat unusual in that it lies in the center itself, its head coinciding with this. Usually it is outside the inner circle, or at least coiled round the central point. One suspects, rightly, as it turned out, that the inner darkness does not conceal the longed for unity, the self, but rather the thonic, feminine nature of the patient. In a later picture, the mandala bursts and the snake comes out. Figure 17 667, the picture was done by a young woman. This mandala is legitimate in so far as the snake is coiled round the forayed middle point. It is trying to get out, it is the awakening of kundalini, meaning that the patient's thonic nature is becoming active. This is also indicated by the arrows pointing outwards. In practice it means becoming conscious of one's instinctual nature. The snake in ancient times personified the spinal ganglia and the spinal cord. Arrows pointing outwards may in other cases mean the opposite, protection of the inside from danger. Figure 18 668, drawn by an older patient. Unlike the previous picture, this one is introverted. The snake is coiled round the forayed center and has laid its head on the white, central point, Shiva Bindu, so that it looks as if it were wearing a halo. There seems to be a kind of incubation of the middle point, the motif of the snake guarding the treasure. The center is often characterized as the treasure hard to attain. Figure 19 669, done by a middle-aged woman. The concentric circles express concentration. This is further emphasized by the fishes circumnavigating the center. The number 4 has the meaning of total concentration. The movement to the left presumably indicates movement towards the unconscious, i.e., immersion in it. Figure 20. 670. This is a parallel to figure 19, sketch of a fish motif, which I saw on the ceiling of the Maharaja's pavilion in Benares. Figure 21. 671, a fish instead of a snake. Fish and snake are simultaneously attributes of both Christ and the devil. The fish is making a whirlpool in the sea of the unconscious, and in its midst the precious pearl is being formed. A Rig Veda hymn says, darkness there was, concealed in darkness, a lightless ocean lost in night. Then the one, that was hidden in the shell, was born through the power of fiery torment. From it arose in the beginning love, which is the germ and the seed of knowledge. 672, as a rule, the snake personifies the unconscious, whereas the fish usually represents one of its contents. These subtle distinctions must be borne in mind when interpreting a mandala, because the two symbols very probably correspond to two different stages of development, the snake representing a more primitive and more instinctual state than the fish, which in history as well was endowed with higher authority than the snake, cf the ichthy symbol. Figure 22. 673. In this picture by a young woman, the fish has produced a differentiated center by circumnavigation, and in it a mother and child stand before a stylized tree of life or of knowledge. Here the fish has a dragon-like nature, it is a monster, a sort of leviathan, which, as the texts from Ras Shamra show, was originally a snake. 16. Once more the movement is to the left. Figure 23. 674. The golden ball corresponds to the golden germ, Hirani Agarbha. It is rotating, and the kundalini winding round it has doubled. This indicates conscious realization, since a content rising out of the unconscious splits at a certain moment into two halves, a conscious and an unconscious one. The doubling is not made by the conscious mind, but appears spontaneously in the products of the unconscious. The rightwards rotation, expressed by the wings, swastika motif, likewise indicates conscious realization. The stars show that the center has a cosmic structure. It has four rays and thus behaves like a heavenly body. The Shatapatha Brahmana says, 
Then he looks up to the sun, for that is the final goal, that the safe resort. To that final goal, to that resort he goes, for this reason he looks up to the sun. He looks up, saying, Self-existent art thou, the best ray of light. The sun is indeed the best ray of light, and therefore he says, Self-existent art thou, the best ray of light. Light bestowing art thou, give me light, Barkas. So say I, said Yajnavalkya, and for this indeed the Brahman should strive, if he would be Brahmabarkasan, illumined by Brahma. He then turns from left to right, saying, I move along the course of the sun. Having reached that final goal, that safe resort, he now moves along the course of yonder sun. 675. This sun has seven rays. A commentator remarks that four of them point to the four quarters, one points upwards, another downwards, but the seventh and best points inwards. It is at the same time the sun's disk, named Hiraniyagarbha. This, according to Ramanuja's commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, 18 is the highest self, the collective aggregate of all individual souls. It is the body of the highest Brahma and represents the collective psyche. For the idea of the self as compounded of many, compare origins each of us is not one, but many and all are righteous, but one receiveth the crown. 676. The patient was a woman of 60, artistically gifted. The individuation process, long blocked but released by the treatment, stimulated her creative activity, figure 21 derives from the same source, and gave rise to a series of happily colored pictures which eloquently express the intensity of her experience. Figure 24 677, done by the same patient. She herself is shown practicing contemplation or concentration on the center, she has taken the place of the fish and the snakes. An ideal image of herself is laid round the precious egg. The legs are flexible, like a nixie's. The psychology of such a picture reappears in ecclesiastical tradition. The Shiva Shakti of the East is known in the West as the man encompassed by a woman, Christ and his bride, the Church. Compare the Maitrayana Brahmana Upanishad, he, the self, is also he who warms, the sun, hidden by the thousand-eyed golden egg, as one fire, by another. He is to be thought after, he is to be sought after. Having said farewell to all living things, having gone to the forest, and having renounced all sensuous objects, let a man perceive the self from his own body. 678. Here too the radiation from the center spreads out beyond the protective circle into the distance. This expresses the idea of the far-reaching effect of the introverted state of consciousness. It could also be described as an unconscious connection with the world. Figure 25. 679. This picture was done by another middle-aged patient. It shows various phases of the individuation process. Down below, she is caught in a thonic tangle of roots, the Maladhara of Kundalini Yoga. In the middle, she studies a book, cultivating her mind and augmenting her knowledge and consciousness. At the top, reborn, she receives illumination in the form of a heavenly sphere that widens and frees the personality, its round shape again representing the mandala in its kingdom of God aspect, whereas the lower, wheel-shaped mandala is thonic. There is a confrontation of the natural and spiritual totalities. The mandala is unusual on account of its six rays, six mountain peaks, six birds, three human figures. In addition, it is located between a distinct above and below, also repeated in the mandala itself. The upper, bright sphere is in the act of descending into the hexad or triad and has already passed the rim of the wheel. According to old tradition, the number six means creation and evolution, since it is a konyangsho of two and three, even and odd equals female and male. Philogidius, therefore, calls the scenarius, 6, the number most suited to generation, 21 the number 3, he says, denotes the surface or flatness, whereas 4 means height or depth. The quaternarius shows the nature of solids, whereas the three first numbers characterize or produce incorporeal intelligences. The number 4 appears as a three-sided pyramid. Point 22 the hexad shows that the mandala consists of two triads, and the upper one is making itself into a quaternity, the state of equability and justice, as Philo says. 
Down below lurk unintegrated dark clouds. This picture demonstrates the not uncommon fact that the personality needs to be extended, both upwards and downwards. Figure 26 and 27. 680, these mandalas are in part atypical. Both were done by the same young woman. In the center, as in the previous mandala, is a female figure, as if enclosed in a glass sphere or transparent bubble. It looks almost as if an homunculus were in the making. In addition to the usual four or eight rays, both mandalas show a pentatic element. There is thus a dilemma between four and five. Five is the number assigned to the natural man, in so far as he consists of a trunk with five appendages. Four, on the other hand, signifies a conscious totality. It describes the ideal, spiritual man and formulates him as a totality in contrast to the pentad, which describes the corporeal man. It is significant that the swastika symbolizes the ideal man, 23, whereas the five-pointed star symbolizes the material and bodily man. 24, the dilemma of four and five corresponds to the conflict between culture and nature. That was the problem of the patient. In figure 26, the dilemma is indicated by the four groups of stars, two of them contain four stars and two of them five stars. On the rims of both mandalas, we see the fire of desire. In figure 27, the rim is made of something that looks like lighted tissue. In characteristic contrast to the shining mandala, both these, especially the second one, are burning. It is flaming desire, comparable to the longing of the homunculus in the retort, Faust, part 2, which was finally shattered against the throne of Galatea. The fire represents an erotic demand, but at the same time an amor fatty that burns in the innermost self, trying to shape the patient's fate and thus help the self into reality. Like the homunculus in Faust, the figure shut up in the vessel wants to become. 681. The patient was herself aware of the conflict, for she told me she had no peace after painting the second picture. She had reached the afternoon of her life and was in her 35th year. She was in doubt as to whether she ought to have another child. She decided for a child, but fate did not let her, because the development of her personality was evidently pursuing a different goal, not a biological, but a cultural one. The conflict was resolved in the interests of the latter. Figure 28. 682, picture by a middle-aged man. In the center is a star. The blue sky contains golden clouds. At the four cardinal points we see human figures, at the top, an old man in the attitude of contemplation, at the bottom, Loki or Hephaestus with red, flaming hair, holding in his hands a temple. To the right and left are a light and a dark female figure. Together, they indicate four aspects of the personality, or four archetypal figures belonging, as it were, to the periphery of the self. The two female figures can be recognized without difficulty as the two aspects of the anima. The old man corresponds to the archetype of meaning, or of the spirit, and the dark phonic figure to the opposite of the wise old man, namely the magical, and sometimes destructive, Luciferian element. In alchemy, it is Hermes Trismegistus versus Mercurius, the evasive trickster. The circle enclosing the sky contains structures or organisms that look like protozoa. The sixteen globes, painted in four colors, just outside this circle, derived originally from an eye motif and therefore stand for the observing and discriminating consciousness. Similarly, the ornaments in the next circle, all opening inwards, are rather like vessels, pouring out their content towards the center. On the other hand, the ornaments along the rim open outwards, as if to receive something from outside. That is, in the individuation process, what were originally projections stream back inside and are integrated into the personality again. Here, in contrast to figure 25, above and below, male and female, are integrated, as in the alchemical hermaphrodite. Figure 29. 683, once again, the center is symbolized by a star. This very common image is consistent with the previous pictures, where the sun represents the center. The sun, too, is a star, a radiant cell in the ocean of the sky. The picture shows the self appearing as a star out of chaos. 
The forayed structure is emphasized by the use of four colors. This picture is significant in that it sets the structure of the self as a principle of order against chaos. 27. It was painted by the same man who did figure 28. Figure 30. 684. This mandala, by an older woman patient, is again split into above and below, heaven above, the sea below, as indicated by the golden waves on a green ground. For wings, revolve leftwards about the center, which is marked only by an orange-red spot. Here too the opposites are integrated and are presumably the cause of the center's rotation. Figure 31. 685, an atypical mandala, based on a dyad. A golden moon and a silver moon form the upper and lower edges. The inside is blue sky above and something like a black crenellated wall below. On it there sits a peacock, fanning out its tail, and to the left there is an egg, presumably the peacock's. In view of the important role which the peacock and the peacock's egg together play in alchemy and also in Gnosticism, we may expect the miracle of the Kata Pavonis, the appearance of all colors, boom, the unfolding and realization of wholeness, once the dark dividing wall has broken down. See Figure 32. The patient thought the egg might split and produce something new, maybe a snake. In alchemy, the peacock is synonymous with the phoenix. A variant of the phoenix legend relates that the cementa bird consumes itself, a worm forms from the ashes, and from the worm, the bird rises anew. Figure 32. 686. This picture is reproduced from the Codex Alchemicus Renoviensis, Central Library, Zurich. Here the peacock represents the phoenix rising newborn from the fire. There is a similar picture in a manuscript in the British Museum, only there the peacock is enclosed in a flask, the vas hermeticum, like the homunculus. The peacock is an old emblem of rebirth and resurrection, quite frequently found on Christian sarcophagi. In the vessel standing beside the peacock the colors of the Cata Pavonis appear, as a sign that the transformation process is nearing its goal. In the alchemical process, the serpent's mercurialis, the dragon, is changed into the eagle, the peacock, the goose of Hermes, or the phoenix. Figure 33, 687, this picture was done by a seven-year-old boy, offspring of a problem marriage. He had done a whole series of these drawings of circles and hung them up round his bed. He called them his loves and would not go to sleep without them. This shows that the magical pictures still functioned for him in their original sense, as a protective magic circle. Figure 34, 688, an 11-year-old girl, whose parents were divorced, had, at a time of great difficulties and upsets, drawn a number of pictures which clearly reveal a mandala structure. Here too, they were magic circles intended to stop the difficulties and adversities of the outside world from entering into the inner psychic space. They represent a kind of self-protection. 689, as on the Kilker, the Tibetan world wheel, figure 3, you can see at either side of this picture something that looks like horns, which as we know belong to the devil or to one of his theriomorphic symbols. The slanting isolates underneath them, and the two strokes for nose and mouth, are also the devils. This amounts to saying, behind the mandala lurks the devil, either the demons are covered up by the magically powerful picture, and thereby eliminated, which would be the purpose of the mandala, or, as in the case of the Tibetan world wheel, the world is caught in the claws of the demon of death. In this picture, the devils merely peek out over the edge. I have seen what this means from another case. An artistically gifted patient produced a typical tetradic mandala and stuck it on a sheet of thick paper. On the back, there was a circle to match, filled with drawings of sexual perversions. This shadow aspect of the mandala represented the disorderly, disruptive tendencies. The chaos that hides behind the self and bursts out in a dangerous way as soon as the individuation process comes to a standstill, or when the self is not realized and so remains unconscious. This piece of psychology was expressed by the alchemists in their Mercurius duplex, who on the one hand is Hermes the mystagogue and psychopomp, and on the other hand is the poisonous dragon, the evil spirit and trickster. Figure 35, 690, drawing by the same girl. Round the sun is a circle with eyes, and round this an Euroboros. The motif of polyophthalmia frequently occurs in individual mandalas. See picture 17 and figure 5 in the preceding paper. In the Maitrayana Brahmana Upanishad 6, 8 the egg, Hyrania Garba, is described as thousand-eyed. 
The eyes in the mandala no doubt signify the observing consciousness, but it must also be borne in mind that the texts as well as the pictures both attribute the eyes to a mythic figure, example, an anthropos, who does the seeing. This seems to me to point to the fascination which, through a kind of magical stare, attracts the attention of the conscious mind. CF Figures 38 and 39 Figure 36 691, Painting of a Medieval City with Walls and Moats, Streets and Churches, Arranged Quadratically The inner city is again surrounded by walls and moats, like the Imperial City in Peking. The buildings all open inwards, towards the center, represented by a castle with a golden roof. It too is surrounded by a moat. The ground round the castle is laid with black and white tiles, representing the united opposites. This mandala was done by a middle-aged man, CF figures 6 and 28, 29. A picture like this is not unknown in Christian symbolism. The heavenly Jerusalem of Revelation is known to everybody. Coming to the Indian world of ideas, we find the city of Brahma on the world mountain, Meru. We read in the Golden Flower, the book of the Yellow Castle says, in the square inch field of the square foot house, life can be regulated. The square foot house is the face. The square inch field in the face, what could that be other than the heavenly heart? In the middle of the square inch dwells the splendor. In the purple hall of the city of Jade dwells the god of utmost emptiness and life. Figure 37 692, painted by the same patient who did figures 11 and 30. Here the seating place is depicted as a child enclosed in a revolving sphere. The four wings are painted in the four basic colors. The child corresponds to Hyrania Garba and to the homunculus of the alchemists. The mythologem of the divine child is based on ideas of this sort. 31. Figure 38. 693, Mandala in Rotation, by the same patient, who did figures 21 and 23. A notable feature is the quaternary structure of the golden wings in combination with the triad of three dogs running round the center. They have their backs to it, indicating that for them the center is in the unconscious. The mandala contains another unusual feature, a triadic motif turning to the left, while the wings turn to the right. This is not accidental. The dogs represent consciousness scenting or intuiting the unconscious, the wings show the movement of the unconscious towards consciousness, as corresponded to the patient's situation at the time. It is as if the dogs were fascinated by the center, although they cannot see it. They seem to represent the fascination felt by the conscious mind. The picture embodies the above-mentioned sesquitertian proportion, 3, 4. Figure 39. 694, the same motif as before, but represented by hairs. From a Gothic window in the cathedral at Potterborn. There is no recognizable center, though the rotation presupposes one. Figure 40. 695, picture by a young woman patient. It too exhibits the sesquitertian proportion and hence the dilemma with which Plato's Timaeus begins, and which as I said plays a considerable role in alchemy as the axiom of Maria. 32. Figure 41. 696, this picture was done by a young woman patient with a schizoid disposition. The pathological element is revealed in the breaking lines that split up the center. The sharp, pointed forms of these breaking lines indicate evil, hurtful, and destructive impulses which might hinder the desired synthesis of personality. But it seems as if the regular structure of the surrounding mandala might be able to restrain the dangerous tendencies to dissociation. And this proved to be the case in the further course of the treatment and subsequent development of the patient. Figure 42 697, a neurotically disturbed mandala. It was drawn by a young, unmarried woman patient at a time that was full of conflict. She was in a dilemma between two men. The outer rim shows four different colors. The center is doubled in a curious way. Fire breaks out from behind the blue star in the black field, while to the right a sun appears, with blood vessels running through it. 
The five-pointed star suggests a pentagram symbolizing man, the arms, legs, and head all having the same value. As I have said, it signifies the purely instinctual, phonic, unconscious man. CF figures 26 and 27. The color of the star is blue, of a cool nature, therefore. But the nascent sun is yellow and red, a warm color. The sun itself, looking rather like the yolk of an incubated egg, usually denotes consciousness, illumination, understanding. Hence we could say of this mandala, a light is gradually dawning on the patient, she is waking out of her formerly unconscious state, which corresponded to a purely biological and rational existence. Rationalism is no guarantee of higher consciousness, but merely of a one-sided one. The new state is characterized by red, feeling, and yellow, or gold, intuition. There is thus a shifting of the center of personality into the warmer region of heart and feeling, while the inclusion of intuition suggests a groping, irrational apprehension of wholeness. Figure 43 698 This picture was done by a middle-aged woman who, without being neurotic, was struggling for spiritual development and used, for this purpose, the method of active imagination. These efforts induced her to make a drawing of the birth of a new insight or conscious awareness, I, from the depths of the unconscious, C. Here the I signifies the self. Figure 44. 699, drawing of motif from a Roman mosaic on the floor of a house in Mach 9, Tunis, which I photographed. It represents an apotropaism against the evil eye. Figure 45. 700, mandala from the Navajo Indians, who with great toil prepare such mandalas from colored sand for curative purposes. It is part of the mountain chant rite performed for the sick. Around the center, there runs, in a wide arc, the body of the rainbow goddess. A square head denotes a female deity, around one a male deity. The arrangement of the four pairs of deities on the arms of the cross suggests a swastika wheeling to the right. The four male deities who surround the swastika are making the same movement. Figure 46 701 Another sand painting by the Navajos, from the male shooting chant. The four horned heads are painted in the four colors that correspond to the four directions. Figure 47 702 here, for comparison, is a painting of the Egyptian sky mother, bending, like the rainbow goddess, over the land with its round horizon. Behind the mandala stands, presumably, the air god, like the demon in figures 3 and 34. Underneath, the arms of the ka, raised in adoration and decked with the eye motif, hold the mandala, which probably signifies the wholeness of the two lands. Figure 48 703, this picture, from a manuscript of Hildegard of Bingen, shows the earth surrounded by the ocean, realm of air, and starry heaven. The actual globe of the earth in the center is divided into four. 704, Bohm has a mandala in his book XL Questions, concerning the soul, see figure 1 of preceding paper. The periphery contains a bright and a dark hemisphere turning their backs to one another. They represent ununited opposites, which presumably should be bound together by the heart standing between them. This drawing is most unusual, but aptly expresses the insoluble moral conflict underlying the Christian view of the world. The soul, Bohm says, is an eye in the eternal abyss, a similitude of eternity, a perfect figure and image of the first principle, and resembles God the Father in his person, as to the eternal nature. The essence and substance of it, merely as to what it is purely in itself, is first the wheel of nature, with the first four forms. In the same treatise Bohm says, the substance and image of the soul may be resembled to the earth, having a fair flower growing out of it, the soul is a fiery eye, from the eternal center of nature, a similitude of the first principle. 36 As an eye, the soul receives the light, as the moon does the glance of the sun, for the life of the soul has its original in the fire. Figure 49 and 50 705, Figure 49 is especially interesting because it shows us very clearly in what relationship the picture stands to the painter. The patient, the same as did Figure 42, has a shadow problem. 
The female figure in the picture represents her dark, thonic side. She is standing in front of a wheel, with four spokes, the two together, forming an eight-rayed mandala. From her head spring four snakes, expressing the tetradic nature of consciousness, but, in accordance with the demonic character of the picture, they do this in an evil and nefarious way, since they represent evil and destructive thoughts. The entire figure is wrapped in flames, emitting a dazzling light. She is like a fiery demon, a salamander, the medieval conception of a fire sprite. Fire expresses an intense transformation process. Hence the prima materia in alchemy was symbolized by the salamander in the fire, as the next picture shows. The spear or arrowhead expresses direction, it is pointing upwards from the middle of the head. Everything that the fire consumes rises up to the seat of the gods. The dragon glowing in the fire becomes volatilized, illumination comes through the fiery torment. Figure 49 tells us something about the background of the transformation process. It depicts a state of suffering, reminiscent on the one hand of crucifixion and on the other of Ixion bound to the wheel. From this it is evident that individuation, or becoming whole, is neither a summum bonum nor a summum desideratum, but the painful experience of the union of opposites. That is the real meaning of the cross in the circle, and that is why the cross has an apotropaic effect, because, pointed at evil, it shows evil that it is already included and has therefore lost its destructive power. Figure 51 706 This picture was done by a 60-year-old woman patient with a similar problem, a fiery demon mounts through the night towards a star. There he passes over from a chaotic into an ordered and fixed state. The star stands for the transcendent totality, the demon for the animus, who, like the anima, is the connecting link between conscious and unconscious. The picture recalls the antique symbolism found, for instance, in Plutarch, 40 the soul is only partly in the body, the other part is outside it and soars above man like a star symbolizing his genius. The same conception can be found among the alchemists. Figure 52 707, picture by the same patient as before, showing flames with a soul rising up from them, as if swimming. The motif is repeated in figure 53. Exactly the same thing, and with the same meaning, can be found in the Codex Renoviensis, 15th century, Zurich, figure 54. The souls of the calcined prima materia escape as vapors, in the form of human figures looking like children, homunculi. In the fire is the dragon, the phonic form of the anima mundi, which is being transmuted. Figure 53 and 54 708, here I must remark that not only did the patient have no knowledge of alchemy, but that I myself knew nothing at that time of the alchemical picture material. The resemblance between these two pictures, striking as it is, is nothing extraordinary, since the great problem and concern of philosophical alchemy was the same as underlies the psychology of the unconscious, namely individuation, the integration of the self. Similar causes, other things being equal, have similar effects, and similar psychological situations make use of the same symbols, which on their side rest on archetypal foundations, as I have shown in the case of alchemy. Conclusion 709 I hope I have succeeded in giving the reader some idea of mandala symbolism with the help of these pictures. Naturally, my exposition aims at nothing more than a superficial survey of the empirical material on which comparative research is based. I have indicated a few parallels that may point the way to further historical and ethnic comparisons, but have refrained from a more complete and more thorough exposition because it would have taken me too far. 710 I need say only a few words about the functional significance of the mandala, as I have discussed this theme several times before. Moreover, if we have a little feeling in our fingertips, we can guess from these pictures, painted with the greatest devotion but with unskillful hands, what is the deeper meaning that the patients tried to put into them and express through them. They are yantras in the Indian sense, instruments of meditation, concentration, and self immersion for the purpose of realizing inner experience, as I have explained in the commentary to the Golden Flower. At the same time, they serve to produce an inner order, which is why, when they appear in a series, they often follow chaotic, 
disordered states marked by conflict and anxiety. They express the idea of a safe refuge, of inner reconciliation and wholeness. 711. I could produce many more pictures from all parts of the world, and one would be astonished to see how these symbols are governed by the same fundamental laws that can be observed in individual mandalas. In view of the fact that all the mandalas shown here were new and uninfluenced products, we are driven to the conclusion that there must be a trans-conscious disposition in every individual which is able to produce the same or very similar symbols at all times and in all places. Since this disposition is usually not a conscious possession of the individual I have called it the collective unconscious, and, as the basis of its symbolical products, I postulate the existence of primordial images, the archetypes. I need hardly add that the identity of unconscious individual contents with their ethnic parallels is expressed not merely in their form but in their meaning. 712. Knowledge of the common origin of these unconsciously preformed symbols has been totally lost to us. In order to recover it, we have to read old texts and investigate old cultures, so as to gain an understanding of the things our patients bring us today in explanation of their psychic development. And when we penetrate a little more deeply below the surface of the psyche, we come upon historical layers which are not just dead dust, but alive and continuously active in everyone, maybe to a degree that we cannot imagine in the present state of our knowledge. 